Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's meeting of the Montpelier City Council. The first uh, item of business is to review the agenda, which I thought I had in front of me, but seems to have misplaced. Uh, um, okay, so I know there are some who we, well, one of the items on the discussion is city manager review, which is um, scheduled for the end of this meeting. I'm going to suggest that we try and reschedule that, um, but I know there's some been some division. That we may have a scheduling challenge. I so maybe we start. Well, first, let me suggest that. See what people think. So we need to do something by March 1st, right? The, the current contract. Yes. yes. To do um, and Bill, you said. So we up here next week. I'm not hearing people. I'm sorry. I don't know if it's yeah. the mics or where they're at. Okay, well, we can do the scheduling at the end of the meeting, even if we're not. Okay, so we're all right with putting that one off. Okay. As long as we can all find. Uh, I'm sure we can sure. find a time. Still late it is at that point. Okay. Um, any other changes to the agenda? Okay. If not, uh, with that objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. The next item is general business and appearances. It's an opportunity for anyone who's here on something that's not on our agenda to raise that. Okay. If we get to something that uh, you are interested in, you may have a call in, just raise your hand. I'm happy to hear from you. Okay. Uh, consent agenda. Do you have a motion to approve that? I guess we'll need to pull the minutes because there's apparently a typo on it that I honestly can't find. So uh, we'll figure it out for next time. Okay. Move to approve the consent agenda less item A. Is there a second? Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, Conservation Commission. We have actually two uh, groups that we need to appoint uh, new members to Conservation Commission and the Planning Commission. Rosie, I know you had so emailed gonna, me and I can't remember which one I'm you I'm going to recuse myself from Conservation Commission because one of the applicants uh, serves above me and I'm a supervisor involved in the agency. Okay, thank you. So we'll take that one up first. Conservation Commission appointments, and we are fortunate to have lots, uh, well, challenging for us, but fortunate, I guess, for the city, lots of great applicants. So um, anyone want, and so we typically would hear from many people who have uh, expressed an interest. So if you're one of those people, if you just come up to the mic, if you would, and introduce yourself and tell us about your interest in serving on the Conservation Commission. Welcome. Yeah. Hi. Pull that down. Okay. I don't have to lean over it. Okay. Um, hi. Um, I'm Brenna Toman. We met last year. Um, I've been an alternate on the commission for since uh, October 2016, um, and I'm really excited that there's four-year positions opening up. Um, so that's what I'm applying for. Um, I guess I'm really excited to continue some of the work that I've started on the commission. Um, one of those is the social media and outreach with the commission. We didn't have a Facebook or anything, so I started that up. Really like to um, keep that going and, and broaden the, it, the scope of that. Um, also, I've been working on uh, restarting the conservation fund, which is that little pool of money um, that we've got sitting on, and starting <laughs> to plan for the 2018 bio blitz with the Nature Center. So. That's what I'm looking forward to, and that's it. Thanks. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any other applicants? Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, it's a little bit short for me. Maybe <laughs> tilt it up and help a little. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that should do it. Maybe you can sit. Um, my name is Nick Giannetti. Um, we also met last year in October. Um, I serve as an alternate role currently on the Conservation Commission, but um, I was also excited to see um, a full-time position up for appointment because, um, as Brenna was alluding to, you've done a lot of great things in the past year, and I feel like the Conservation Commission is really rolling now because we have a lot of new faces and a lot of participation. Um, one of the projects that I'm heading is um, kind of like our stormwater project, and um, I'm working with the Friends of the Winooski and the Public Works Department to hopefully complete some of those items on the stormwater master plan that were identified by um, Stone Environmental. So we've been reaching out to a few private property owners, so hopefully we can um, do some direct implementation, like building some rain gardens and also doing some outreach to some of the, um, the local folks to hopefully uh, 
maybe take some of that water out of our combined sewer system. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that's it. So, any questions for Nick? I forgot to ask that about uh, about uh, Rhino as well. No. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Okay. Who's next? Yes. Hi. Hi. Welcome. I'm, thank you. I'm Katie Michaels. I am a new member of the Montpelier community. I moved here in September, and I'm interested in serving on the Conservation Commission in large part to get to know this place better and to um, be a more active member and to be able to give back to Montpelier. And I feel like getting to know the natural areas here has helped me make a home here, so I'd love to be part of them um, and help make them beautiful. And I have a, I work for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, so I have a professional interest in land use. Um, and prior to that, I worked for the High Meadows Fund, where I had a lot of experience working in land use resilience. So I would bring those experiences to the role. And I'm not sure if this is appropriate, but I'm also a good friend of Shelby Perry, who I know has applied to the Conservation Commission. And I just wanted to put a pitch in for her as well. Um, she is an incredible naturalist, and she's the sort of person who you take a hike with her, and it's like a three-hour hike to go two miles because she's just very curious about all the things she sees. So I just wanted to speak on her behalf as well. Well, glad you did. Thank you. Okay, who is next? Hi, uh, I'm Jamie Bates, and um, so I've been participating as a member of, a pub of the public for the Montpelier Conservation Commission, and I first heard about it from Nick and Brenna, and um, I was just curious to know about um, the commission, and uh, after going to those meetings, I realized it was something that I really wanted to be a part of. Um, I have been working on um, a logo for Montpelier Conservation Commission, because um, as you, as was mentioned before, in my, um, excuse me, I'm not used to public speaking a whole lot. <laughs> um, so with the bio blitz coming up, um, we thought it would be a good opportunity to have a logo out there for the Montpelier Conservation Commission. Um, but I also have a lot of other interests within uh, nature and um, protecting and conserving what Montpelier has to offer. Um, so I'm just really excited to um, possibly participate in the Montpelier Conservation Commission. Thank you, Jamie. I'm, <laughs> I'm Glennie Sewell. Um, you all saw me here, I believe, more than a year ago, so we're applying for the alternate. And to be very honest, a lot more time has opened up on my hands because at the time I went in as an alternate, time closed in around me with other institutions. I, right now I'm just with Norwich at the moment, and um, I do a little work with CCB, but I'm not with NECI anymore. I don't mind if it's, it's, if it's one of the seats or an alternate, to be very honest. I still want to keep my time in and push to stay on, at least stay on that commission until I can give a great deal more time of myself. It's one of those things where I'd, I want to do something, and if I, and if the time so since the time has opened up, I still want to be able to give it to someone. I don't like time sitting open doing absolutely nothing, twiddling my thumbs and watching YouTube. That's not happening. So it can be Norwich and and and, and the um, Conservation Com Commission, however it goes. Thank you, Glennie. Anyone else? Uh, my name is Michael Wozorczak. Submitted the uh, cover letter, which explains my background of uh, natural resources attorney work. Served on a number of land trusts, ran a nonprofit in the western <coughs> states, been a wildland firefighter. So, public interest is what I'm excited about, and uh, anything I can contribute or answer any questions, I'm happy to do so. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, do we have a motion to go to executive session to discuss this, these uh, applications? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, everybody say aye. 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 Okay. We will be back uh, shortly.
Okay, we all set to uh, reconvene. Would move to come out of executive session. Okay. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, if I could uh, get everyone's attention, we're back in session. And did you want to make a motion? Uh, yeah, so uh, I would move that uh, to the four four year seats we uh, appoint Brenna Toman, Nick Gianetti, Emily Byrne, uh, and Jamie Bates. And to the two alternate seats, uh, we appoint Michael Lazorchek and Katie Michaels. I'll make a second. <laughs> Is there a discussion? Just now, time to say yes, that anyone now. who hasn't been nominated, uh, we really want your participation. We just have only so many slots, so don't be discouraged. John, yeah, sure, please. Hi, I'm John Jose. I'm the vice chair of the Conservation Commission, and I just want to add to what Donna said. Um, we're a very open, inclusive, informal group. And we really encourage people to come and sit around the table with us and discuss conservation issues uh, in the city. As Jamie indicated, that's how she got started with us as a member of the public. Um, the other thing I want to mention, too, which is important, is we're in the process. Um, we have set forth a very ambitious, ambitious agenda for ourselves based, based on a, a visioning process we went through. And to accomplish everything we want to accomplish, we're actually in the process of forming subcommittees. And my understanding is those do, do not need necessarily to be an alternate or a sitting member on the commission to participate in those committees. So regardless of whether or not you were selected for an alternative seat or a, a standing seat on the commission, uh, if you're interested, uh, that's definitely an opportunity for you to be involved in the Conservation Commission and we more than welcome you. And uh, tomorrow night um, happens to be our regular monthly meeting. So you're more than welcome to join us right here council chambers okay, great thank you john and i know i say this every time but it's just as always is amazing the number and quality of applicants that we get for these boards and commissions i think it's a real testament to montpelier that uh, we have uh, residents who volunteer and are so committed to the community so thank you all for both serving and all of you who who have applied um really is appreciated any further discussion? Yeah, Justin. I would just add, I, there's a lot of exciting things going on in this commission right now. We heard a little bit about the stormwater projects and specifically the outreach by the high school. Sounds super exciting to um, kind of putting a little bit more public face and in letting people know what we're doing too in terms of planting or stormwater control there and other sites. Um, and also this bio blitz at the North Branch Nature Center that's coming up. So it'll be... Uh, incumbent upon everyone who's new to this committee to make sure you go to those meetings and help keep these projects moving forward. Okay, if there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so next round is uh, uh, Planning Commission appointments. And let's see. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry. Come on. I was going to call up our agenda, but go ahead, please. Uh, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Ariane Kassanam, and I'm interested in serving on the Planning Commission just, you know, generally as most people have said, Montpelier is a great community, and I'm just interested in getting more involved. Um, I have a master's degree in planning, so I wanted to bring back some of those more technical skills and uh, contribute them to the Planning Commission, and also in my work at the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, I work with affordable housing developers, so I have a sense of some of the development challenges. Um, you know, I reviewed the French Pond project that's going in above Aubuchon's this summer. Um, so I bring that um, expertise as well. And I'm just interested in, you know, technical aspects of how you can um, continue to create vibrant, maintain and create vibrant um, communities. And I have a four-year-old daughter who will be starting kindergarten soon. So I'm definitely invested in the long-term viability and success of Montpelier. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Smith. I live over on Charles Street. Um, I'm happy to be in front of you once again when there are actual vacancies on the Planning Commission, so I'm hopeful that I'll be uh, appointed this round. I've been, I've been attending the Planning Commission meetings, the last several of them, and it's been 
a really good opportunity to see what the Planning Commission is doing uh, and get a, a better sense of what the what the plan is going forward for the next couple of years uh, and I'm and, and to see how the committee works and how they function so that's that's been really good I'm I'm particularly excited about uh, a new city plan and starting to put that together um, I'm I used to work at the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission and I worked with other municipalities to develop their plans and I'm I'd like to have a more active role in the place where I live in, in that process. Um, and I'm, I have a master's degree in planning. I'm a planner. I work for the state of Vermont. I have a lot of experience in planning, and I'm excited to bring that to the table in the place that I live. So thank you guys for considering me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm Paul Carnahan. Uh, I live on Saban Street. Um, really enjoy living in Montpelier and uh, want to see it continue as a great uh, great community to, to raise families or to live as, as individuals um, and I'd like to be on the Planning Commission to uh, to help move that forward um, I don't see any um, big changes um, I think uh, I, I'm interested in working on the, the uh, master plan. Um, I think the master plan could use a lot of focus. Uh, right now it's a very unwieldy document um, and I think that uh, I could bring some um, some some work to that to, to try to focus it a little bit on exactly what the uh, the priorities of the uh, of the committee of the Commission and the community are. Um, and I'd like to um, you know bring some um, some balance to the um, to the community in terms of growth and preserving the things that we like about about Montpelier, um, I think there's a lot of things that uh, that are exciting about Montpelier that we can um, move move forward. Um, I've been involved in the um, uh, Montpelier Live uh, Downtown um, Committee Design Committee for for a while, and um, I think we've done a lot of uh, exciting things uh, to to move Montpelier forward in that regard. And I'd like to continue on the Planning Commission. Thank you, Paul. Anyone else? No? Okay, do we have a motion to go to executive session? So moved. Second. In favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, we'll turn again. Sorry. Right.
the motion to come back into executive session. So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And uh, I guess I would just uh, observe that this was a really tough decision, and uh, for those very well qualified people who uh, we don't appoint, uh, there may be some opportunities uh, coming up very soon. So, um, depending on how the charter change goes, we'll determine that timing. But uh, right, so uh, uh, we, I would uh, move that we appoint Stephanie Smith and Ariane Kassam uh, to the planning commission. A second. Is there a discussion? If none. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Bill, could you just describe that charter change that I think it would be helpful for people so, to know that we are, you have made a charter change that's relevant to the people who have both applied and been appointed to the Planning Commission? One of the, the problems we have with our current setup with both the Design uh, Development Review Board and the Planning Commission is that the term lengths are specified but not the actual terms. If somebody leaves mid-term, you can't fill out a, an existing term. You have to appoint someone new for the whole three years or two years. So. We're, we proposed a charter change that appoints all of the planning commissioners, I believe, on May 1st and all of the DR people on October 1st, and then they have set terms. Uh, and if somebody leaves in the, the middle, then we just fill out the unexpired term. So if that passes and is in effect by May 1st, we'll probably have to reappoint all seven planning commissioner man uh, members, you know, four to two-year terms and three to one-year terms, presumably. Uh, so just FYI, there could be, you know, s some existing members may choose to sit, step down at that time. There could be another process. So. And we, again, we really appreciate everyone applying, and we want you to reach out and attend and participate. Every committee is open. Commissions, likewise, are open to having you participate, even if you can't vote on certain things. Uh, Justin, I would also add, as Mrs. Smith's um, acceptance is evidence of um, persistence pays off here, and um, we really certainly consider people's willingness to start attending meetings beforehand, um, to be involved and get brought up to speed uh, prior to appointments. Uh, additionally, uh, at least one member of that is still on the Planning Commission I know has expressed interest in getting through our uh, zoning and master plan process and then will potentially be stepping away. So stay tuned. Uh, May midsummer august probably latest there'll be several new seats opening up on this commission and again thanks for everyone who's both well everyone who's applied and uh, everyone who's serving on the commission thank you okay so we will be moving on oh we need to vote we had yeah. okay. no i thought we, we voted yeah. we, we voted, voted, voted this time my bad all right uh item seven on our agenda dog ordinance second reading Allen, I'm the assistant city manager. Do we want to go around and just? Uh, Bob Gowans, I'm the health officer and fire chief. I'm Neil Martell, I'm the captain of the department. Steve Onberg, director of the Montpelier Community Justice Center. Welcome, and I'll, everyone. I'll just uh, briefly remind you that this is second reading of an ordinance that you've already looked at once. Um, it was requested that the first reading be um, visited by the Vermont League of Cities and Towns to assure that it was a civil process and not a criminal process and to tighten the language to look around at what other communities had done. So that's what the delay has been to bring you a second reading. Um, this doesn't change much other than tighten up what we had a little bit and clarify things. It does the highlights. It requires that dogs be on a leash on a city street, a sidewalk, or a recreation path. It clarifies what constitutes running at large. It tightens some of the definitions. The league did that. For example, dangerous dog and who constitutes an owner of a dog, um, to include dog sitters, for example. It makes it clear that this is a civil offense, and it encourages violators to participate in the Montpelier Community Justice Center process. If you want to appeal, there is an appeals process through the Judicial Bureau, and it spells that out. 
Uh, it also reconstitutes the Animal Control Committee, which just hadn't been meeting uh, and needs to be reappointed, and at some point we'll bring that back to the council for approval. Uh, they will handle the most serious offenses under this, and it spells out the fines. So we're here to take any questions you have as you consider second reading. Okay, Dennis, uh, welcome. You want to go? Are you are going to make some comment? Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, great. Um, okay, firstly, um, I just wanted to uh, tell you, all of you, that um, there's a, a real improvement to this ordinance. Um, especially the um, uh, uh, the, the you know c calculation of offenses and uh, and defining uh, uh, violations as uh, civil offenses. So that's really great. Um, I you know, I I did um, email all of you um, trying to argue the point that this is really a completely different document from the document that was. Uh, read on August 23rd, so it's not, you know, it's it's really a first read. It is, I would argue that this is a first reading of a document that is, you know, uh, uh, 11 pages as opposed to five. Uh, it has uh, what, uh, eight new definitions. Um, it's a lot. There's a lot that's different in it, and I would, and it's complicated. It's. Um, uh, <coughs> confusing in a lot of a lot of places, and I would argue that this needs to be a first reading and allow people who are concerned with this issue and are concerned with this uh, the ordinance um, have uh, be able to comment and have a second reading on this. So, <laughs> other comments? Huh? I'm sorry, you. So that's what. So that's what I would like to ask. Is that is that possible at all? I think. Why don't we go ahead and get, we're going to go through this and see what people and then we'll make a decision on that. At, once okay. we finish tonight. We're going to go through this. a page by page. Then? No, but we'll hear comments from you and then the staff and, and the council members will make we'll ask questions and then I think okay. at the I end of our discussion have, we'll. I make also a have um, uh, you know some um, uh, uh, changes, uh, not terribly significant that I'd like to pass out in case so we so when I go through this you could look at okay sure yeah. thank you I'm all alone today everybody's sick well, John's been I can sick. understand <laughs> <laughs> having now yeah we've been through it thank you I have my sympathy thank John. you um to uh, talk about is the um, in the running at large category we would like that to be uh, we a number of people would like to include uh, would like to exempt the area where a uh, public area where dogs are allowed to be offered um, the bike and recreation path has really caused a lot of confusion I have four or five emails asking what does that mean what is how, how do you define bike recreation path is so, that the one on page eight um, on, about uh, running at large is that where that starts is it, mm -hmm. it's eight two oh seven and Donna just to, as a no, process question nuisance. you're working off the red purple yes. green yes, line the, version the version that we're all that's the running at large is 12. We're it's number 12. Page 4. So my, um, our suggestion is on uh, 12B, clearly under the verbal or nonverbal control and inside of the owner who has a leash in their possession uh, or in a public space where dogs are permitted to be off leash. Uh, and uh, if 
I mean, we have to, we have said that we weren't going to, uh, this was not going, uh, we, <laughs> I don't know what I want to say here. Um, but this is, that's the way uh, Hubbard Park is at this point under their code of uh, conduct. So I'd like to uh, propose that change. I'm sorry, so I'm sure sure yes. there's a part of this hard to follow because it's a double negative. Writing a large dog off the premises and not clearly into the verbal agreement. And not on a leash if on a city street sidewalk. Not on a city street. So or bike recreation path. Not not on a city street. Right. So I guess that means yeah, so on, on a city street, they are. Right. They need a leash. Okay. But I, I hear you though on the confusing part about like if, they, if you're on a bike or recreation path, do you need a leash? It says it has the to be on a leash. Yes. The intent was yes. As I understand the confusion is that they, some people think paths in Hubbard Park and other places are also recreation paths. There's some confusion as to what what that means, and so there was some, there was actually a suggestion about <coughs> simply making clear that uh, Maryland Mode, it's in some language about um, this definition doesn't apply to Hubbard Park. Well, also, I don't know whether you saw, but also you had an email from John um, Apple, Apple, he, he was also supporting the same language. That right. And um, I, I probably nobody got to see it. Um, I guess it came out uh, uh, early it came afternoon. Out yesterday. I mean, however you want to define it, that this definition shall not apply to Hubbard Park where dogs are allowed to be off the leash. It's in compliance with the Hub Hubbard Park uh, Canine Code of Conduct. Rosie. Are we going to have discussion or want to keep going? Well, I, how, many, how many proposals are you? I have a lot. I'd like to. Um, I want it. This is a. This is one that's very um, prominent. There's a lot of people have talked about this, um, and uh, I have uh, also the fines. I believe uh, people have also been concerned about how high the fines are. Uh, so I'd like to talk about that and the, um, uh, the appeal process, which is not really very clearly spelled out in this. Okay, so why don't we just start working our way through those, Justin? Mr. Mayor, I would just comment that um, Mrs. Riggle certainly has uh, taken opportunity to speak to us multiple times, both prior and during first reading, so uh, well, I'm welcome to engage in this process. Um, the document in front of us, I think, is a reflection of uh, previous uh, attempts to run this through leagues of cities and towns and come up with a document that um, will ensure that our community is well served by a reasonable um, level of enforcement for um, dogs and um, I guess specifically dogs. Um, so I guess I would just remind council that we've, we have been through this and um, this is our best attempt at meeting everyone's needs. And while we understand that certain individuals in the community may not want to see any level of um, leash enforcement or um, fines, associated with that I think we're trying to find a balance uh, that serves everyone here okay. thanks for that reminder okay so Rosie did you have a suggestion you well I don't mind clarifying that this definition that, that the Park Commission's policies apply in Hubbard Park and not this definition I don't want to go so far as to put in our regulation that um, what the Park Commission's uh, regulations are because those could potentially change in the future, sure. and I don't want to have those in exactly. Regulation. That's that's so, why I suggested a public space where dogs are permitted off leash. So I don't, I can understand how it would be confusing to somebody, and I don't mind making a minor clarification like that. I just don't want to go as far as to say anything further about whether or not they're required to be leashed. Any objection to that change? That's okay. Good. Okay, Dennis, should we? Okay, the other thing nice. under the authority in this new document, I think you need to include 29 BSA 1974A, which deals with uh, you know, appeals from the Judicial Bureau. Um, I'm sorry, before we go on, uh, you asked if there's any objection to that part. I, I am a little wary about striking the part um, when not on a city street um, sidewalk. So I, didn't I don't have think there was any. 
Pregnant. Suggestion about that. I, okay. I think <coughs> the way okay. I interpreted okay. um, Councilmember Kruger's comment was that the, the language that was suggested would say something like, "This definition shall not be um, applied to Hubbard Park where do if dogs are in compliance with the Hubbard Park Canine Code of Conduct as promulgated." So it doesn't say where they're allowed to be off leash, just as if they're consistent if they're, with the yep, Code yep, of Conduct. Right. Yep. Because then, if they're out of compliance, it's applicable. It would apply. So. So we're not necessarily. So we're adopting the code of conduct by reference, and if they change that, then. We change that. Okay. Okay. We're staying. We're keeping. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, um, on to the uh, monetary penalties. Uh, they are. Um, I was just. Uh, so they're extremely high, and if you look at um, like the uh, dog license. Uh, uh, Penalties. They're sort of outrageous, and it seems to me that. Um, Are you uh, looking at page? Is this page eight? Eight of the so licensing. Eight licensing. Dash two zero four for licensing. The second warning is hundred. The third is two. Fourth the, is five hundred for the licensing. Yes. Yeah. So I, I not, so I would like to um, just offer this that um, uh, failure to license fees being set so high are likely to discourage compliance. Uh, and I'm asking why don't we uh, try to incentivize compliance. License fees could be discounted in recognition of practices that demonstrate responsible ownership. In no case will a discount bring the cost of the license below a base established. Uh, discounts could be given for, and this is important because all of this is about, you know, education and communication. So a discount could be given for completion for an AKC Canine Good Citizen course, proof of an obedience title awarded by an organization, permanent identification of the dog by microchip, membership in an obedience club, uh, multiple year licenses tied to a three year vaccination. It's not now a vaccination for three years after the initial ones. So look, I think that these kinds of things that, um, you know, that distinguish between uh, responsible and irresponsible pet owners, and that's what we want to create. <coughs> we, we don't need to beat people up. So for the dog licensing thing, I would suggest something that really encourages people to participate and to be better, more responsible owners. Yes. I just would ask the city clerk, what is the state level of dog licensing? We're plus five on that, so. Yeah, it's ten dollars. We're plus five on that, and included in the budget was to add another three. Eighteen. So you might want to do that in. This. But, but, but this is about like um, you know penalties for not licensing, and you also might want to give a, a break to financial staff people to license because it's everybody's benefit to have a dog license microchip. Okay, what's okay. what else do you have? Okay. Um, so let me go on to the uh, let me go on to the um, enforcement which is eight two oh six Let's go back to the uh, the dangerous the definition for dangerous, um, which is uh, two. It is uh, eight oh two eight two oh two number two. Danger shall mean any dog, regardless of breed, breeding, type, or appearance. I don't know why that was taken out because I think we want to have um, uh, 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 we don't want to have breed specific laws, and that's a a thing that has been, um, you know, we've been something that, that uh, various community states are doing not to have, uh, not to make any kind of free distinction. So, um, okay, so dangerous. Um, then it inflicts an, uh, a serious 
injury on or kills a domestic animal. Um, and I would say that we um, use the definition instead of serious injury on severe injury, which is, um, which is used and it has a specific definition for it. Uh, and it was it was in the original in the first in our in the uh, ordinance that's in effect now, um, and, uh, because I think this is, this becomes um, uh, uh, too subjective. It's better to have a very distinct um, a, a very distinct. And I can give the, give, give you this to this uh, too for the dangers. Definition for dangerous, mm -hmm. which is number 10. Mm -hmm. Six. Dangerous is two, to potentially number dangerous two. is 10. Yeah, number two. Under, eight, 202. 8202, number two. So, so Dennis, where are you, what are you look? Where are we here? Well, I'm trying to keep this. Eight, 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 I think it's on. What it is? Eight dash two eight zero. Eight two zero two, and it's number two. Dangerous shall mean any dog, regardless of breed, breeding type, or appearance, who, when when unprovoked, inflicts a, a uh, I would say, severe injury serious injury on or kills a domestic animal or inflicts an injury on a person which requires medical attention or, or C, inflicts serious, severe injury on or kills a human being. Severe injury meaning any physical injury to a human being that results in muscle, muscle tears or disfiguring lacerations or requires multiple sutures or corrective cosmetic surgery. That's used in Florida, California, Washington, North Carolina. Maryland, Pennsylvania, Association of Pet Dog Owners, uh, uh, it's something that is, is, has been uh, thought to be a better definition of serious injury. Of, uh, of serious injury. Okay. What's next? What do you okay. <laughs> All right. Um, continuing on. Um, Under these definitions, shall not apply if the dog was protecting or defending itself. Um, was in reaction to the disease, please include disease, pain, or an injury, uh, protecting itself, its offspring, another domestic animal, or a person, or protecting its owner's property from attack or assault, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, to, or uh, the dog was engaged in, the person attacked threatened by the dog was engaged in teasing, tormenting, battering, assaulting, and then please add, or has in the past been observed or reported to have tormented, abused, or assaulted the dog, or was committing or attempting to, make, to commit a crime. I don't know if this is useful. Is this useful at all? Well, I guess... I, I feel like I should, no. be, I should get, can give this to you in writing. It would be help, more helpful in writing for sure. It's hard to follow when you're reading it. Um, we, this is what you've given us, right? Right. That, those were some concerns I had. It's not... It, it, we're not going through it one by one. But there. I guess what I'm... I, I mean, you're happy to, I'm happy to have you present these, and then what I'm going to say, any city councilor wants to propose that we make these changes, feel free to do that. I mean, I'm not, we're not going to take a vote on every one of your proposals, but if somebody wants to make a motion either now or while you're raising or at the end, we'll do that. But I, I'm just mostly cognizant of the time that, know, that, that Justin says, well, not just tonight, but also that has gone into this ordinance, the amount of vetting right. and discussion, right. and uh, uh, and and frankly, just the, the level of work we have to do tonight. So I just want to get through this in a, in a reasonable, to give you an opportunity to present your concerns, but also um, to do that in, a, in an expeditious way. Okay, well then the enforcement. And I Dane, it's just to reassure you, if we've done a lot of wordsmithing with the committee, you went to the, the league for more, and if we find over time, and really in a month, two months, we can go back and do edits, we can do changes. So we, we don't, 
have some language exactly the way you want it to write doesn't mean we can't get it there. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so under the enforcement, um, this is the question I have, is uh, any violation of the ordinance shall be a civil matter which may be enforced in Vermont Judicial Bureau or in Washington County Superior Court at the election of the chief of police or enforcement officer. What does that mean? How does that work? So by moving this to a civil venue, mm -hmm. it, we would issue a what is known as a municipal, municipal civil violation for these type of infractions. Right. Or we could. Um, you would be given a, what is known as a summons. It's not a criminal right. thing. It's a civil ticket to appear. It's very similar right. venue to what a, what a traffic ticket is. Right, it's, exactly. It's, it's heard by a hearing officer. Right. The hearing officer would hear the dog owner's side of the story and the law enforcement officer or representative. The hearing officer would be the hearing officer at the Judicial Bureau? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then who, and then the police officer or the enforcement officer, yes. is there like the, like the... Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. the same as with what we do with municipal, okay. uh, with, with traffic tickets mm -hmm. we present. Mm -hmm. if, it, if I was the issuing officer, mm -hmm. I would go. If it was another officer, it would probably be that officer. Right. They would present the facts right. of what they knew right. to the constitutional right. violation. The hearing officer would hear from both sides and make a finding. Okay, but what does this mean? That, or, uh, the, the, at the election, superior, at the election of the chief of police or enforcement officer, um, in addition means they to, may or, choose or, not to bring it to court. Right, they right. Like so, so the thought process that we put into this is What's the, yeah. is being wanting to be a restorative community and, and utilizing Yvonne's resources. Our first attempt would be to say to the dog owner, "Are you willing to participate in the restorative process?" Uh -huh. If they are, that would be the first mechanism that we would use. They would have that choice. If they said, "No, I don't want to." then the fallback would be we would issue this municipal civil violation ticket and they could go before a hearing officer and state, you know, their reasons why they... Or they could just or, pay the waiver or fine. Or they could pay the waiver fine, mail it in, and be... All right, so so you would... So, all right, so the, uh, the enforcement officer would first ask if you wanted to go through a, a restorative justice process. Right. But, uh, and both people, both the, the transgressor and... The injured party would have to agree to that, correct? Um, well, in particular, I mean, we're dealing with the dog owner, mm -hmm. so I mean, that dog owner would have to be willing to participate in it. As a, and the injured party. Um, it's, it, if there is an injured party. I mean, that would be a be a part of the fulfillment of the process of the difficult restorative process is that the victim would have input in that okay, process. Well, if there's no the victim, they don't. They, there's nothing to compel. Or no reason to compel an affected person to participate, but we always invite them to give an opportunity. Okay, but what if there's no victim? If the dog, if the dog's running the, at large, the, the person, if the dog's person on license, how do you? What, or if what, the, the person wants to participate in the restorative process, they would meet with uh, our restorative justice panel, have the conversation, and then together create a. An agreement about um, how to make things better. Okay, so if you would do that with the injured person, or if there is no injured person, either way, either way, you would do that. Is restitution part of that? If if there is restitution, if, if there have been material damages, then in order to complete the restorative process, the dog owner would need to take care of those financial damages as was talked about and agreed to in the Okay, but they don't, but no, nobody has to go through that process if they don't want to. No, you can pay your fine. Okay, so that's not very contest, clear here. They can contest the ticket. You can contest the ticket and have a hearing have officer. A hearing you, can pay, you can just admit it, pay the fine, you can pay the waiver fine and not contest it at all, or you can go to restorative justice. Is there just is does restorative justice have do you work on do you, does restorative justice work on civil cases? We do now. Since when? Since the last iteration of the Dana, so I'm going to jump in because okay. I, I know you need to get these answered, but I 
we're just not going to be able to use the entire city okay. council public time so, to get so questions. So how, how should we how should we go through this? I have also questions that people have sent to me, asking you know asking uh, the answered. I feel like we're being filibustered. I mean, you've, uh, this process. I, I know there's uh, been I a. I feel like this is a memo. <laughs> um, is I know that this has been a public process. This has been there's been gone. No, oh, I started. I was involved in this years ago, well, and I know that there's been years since then of work that's gone into this ordinance. So. It's ruining my life. Well, we don't want that, uh, but we also want to make sure we don't that we adjourn before All midnight right, so tonight. Can we, so can we can can we make this a first reading and then have a second reading? Well, why, how many amendments are you proposing? How many more? I thought there were just a handful, but it sounds like there's well, more than no, that. Well, there's, there's some more. I'm, and thank you, Donna, for that, because we, you know, like language, then I'll just, we'll just remove. But there's some, there, but, there, yeah, there, So there, how many there. proposed changes are you, do you have for us okay, tonight? Okay, so there's the judicial, there's the judicial bureau, the appeal process within the judicial bureau. There's the difference between a, a, a animal control committee and the um, city council. So in this document, it seemed to be overlapping and it's not clear whose job is what. I mean, um, um, my understanding would be that the animal, animal Control Committee is a legislative body that the city council has created. Is that correct? Is that what that would be? Yes, with some Quasi -judicial definition. Quasi-judicial some what through the ordinance. Yeah. Some members on the committee are prescribed. We know that. Okay. Right. We know so that. Yes. But so they have, so that isn't in fact standing, that is like the legislative body. Like in statute law, that would be the legislative body, the Animal Control Committee, which is being made from the, the city council is creating an Animal Control Committee. So they have like a magisterial role, is that correct? I don't quite know how to answer that. Okay. So, Dan said, what I'm going to ask you to do is, is, is clearly and succinctly as you can uh, make suggestions to the council as to what changes you would like on the ordinance. We will consider those, and then we need to make a decision about the proposal before us. So, I'm going to give you, you know, another five, ten minutes, and if you could do that, and then we're going to need to make a vote on the proposal. This is not a new issue. This has been around for years, but, uh, but we need to make decisions <laughs> and are, move this on. Is, this is all very new stuff here. That we have, we haven't considered the, the, you know, the the, the results of these new, of these new conditions, these new ordinances. Um, well, with all due respect, actually, these these were presented three weeks ago, yes. and was postponed in part because of the hour and in part because of right, your request. So this is right. And most of the changes that were made were actually due to your request. I feel like a lot of the questions you're asking we've gone through before. You like wanted which, clarity like about the request? civil procedure, which is really the only substantive change. I mean, I'm probably way out of bounds here as an administrative officer as opposed to a policy person, but I, 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 we've had, you've, you've been actively involved and I don't understand if you had this many comments why you couldn't have sent them to us even yesterday would have been helpful, I think. So, I mean, it's the council will do what they want. But those, okay. my two cents is when someone who's been involved in this with you for a long period of time, I feel right. like we've tried to accommodate all of your concerns. Thank you. If they're not just my concerns. I understand, but you voice yeah. them. Right. Um, okay, so we're going to take the next five to ten minutes, right. and I'm going to ask you to all right, so I would like your to comments ask, within that. So I, I would like to see the appeal process spelled out. In this. Do you have a proposal for us? I, mean, well, I think I can write it up, I suppose. It's here. I think it's there is on, a It's on clear. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's unclear how we make it, how, you know, how does it go to, how do you make an appeal to the Superior Court if you don't like the hearing officers? Presumably, then you're into the rules and procedures of the court. However, same way you appeal a parking ticket. I don't know how that works, but there's clearly a process at that point it's outside of the city's appeal. Okay, process. so duly noted that, that you don't take objection to the lack of clarity in the appeal process. In here. Is that your concern? Right, I take objection to the lack of clarity in the appeal process. Okay. Um, for uh, 
and the fines, the fines are very, are way, way too high. In, uh, say, like in Burlington, what they do, they get all the fines, the fines are the same for any violation, first, second, third offense. And they go from uh, the first, <coughs> first one is like $100 with the waiver fee. Um, you know, we're talking about $450, $300, and I don't know that really there's any um, uh, basis for that. Is there? Your concern. This is not a. We're not going to debate this, but I understand you're raising that concern. What else? What are your? What other issues do you have? Okay. So, here's some questions from some uh, other citizens. Um, rules for playing ball on the state house lawn, Dog River Field. I mean, is it like playing ball, high school fields? Is that what happens there? Barking in an owner's house, if the owners are at work, is the, would that become a nuisance if the dog barks all the time? In, inside an owner's house, owner's, owner dog, owner's house. Or in an apartment building, a multi-unit building. This is a public process. Yeah, we're going to raise concerns. We just can't. I'm just not going to do it all night. But if you have concerns that you want to raise, I want to provide you with that opportunity. Well, I, can't, I don't have it. I, I can't do it now. I can't do it in five minutes. So I give up. Do we have anyone else who is here to uh, talk about the dog ordinance? Okay, are there any other council questions, comments? Anyone want to make a motion? I just wonder if I need Proceed. to formalize that change that we made. Maybe make a motion on that or yes. so I really Bill's language was good. I'd like to just use that. <laughs> I don't remember what it was. So I'm taking the language proposed by Marilyn Mode and John. Um, I can't see his last name. It's and just taking out one little clause that says uh, goes under section eight oh two, definition twelve. I would say this definition shall not apply to Hubbard Park where dogs are in compliance with the Hubbard Park Canine Code of Conduct as promulgated by the Parks Commission. So uh, I move to insert that language as was read by the city manager. So are you making a full motion to accept this? Oh, I was just making amendment? a motion to add that. I guess I guess I could make a full motion to. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead if you don't mind? Okay. <laughs> um, I move that the city council accept the um, sorry, I'm not sure how to formulate this motion. Um, what's that? Pass second reading. To, I move that the council pass the second reading and adopt uh, the amendments to Article 2, the Dog and Animal Control Ordinance. Um, as with the no, addition, just, with the amendment, just articulate. articulate. Right. <laughs> I'll second it. All right. What, 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 can you also add the uh, in the authority 24 BSA 1974A? Um, in the authority? So we're in discussion. I, I, that, that, so hold on second. just a second, Marilyn. So we've got. Uh, the motions are made. Did, did you second? Thank okay, so now it's discussion. Um, if you want to raise that as a question, I guess somebody if can. You're, if you're adding some language, <coughs> can you add to the authority for this uh, 24 BSA 1974? I, I, a council can, I don't, I mean, somebody can offer that if they want to. I mean. I'm not comfortable doing that because we've had this so thoroughly legally, legally reviewed, and I don't really want to make changes to that at this point. Okay, is there any further discussion? The only change you might want to consider making is under the park about dog licenses where it says it's five dollars above the state fee. We did pass a budget that, or, well, we haven't passed it. Assuming the budget passes, it assumes that it would be eight dollars above the state fee. So our revenue change, so we want to amend that now. Is that correct? I would make a motion to amend the pending motion to change the number five to eight 
as it relates to licensing fees. I'll second. Discussion? Okay. Uh, so we'll vote the amendment. First would be a motion on the vote on the amendment. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And uh, then next would be the vote on the underlying ordinance. A motion to approve the ordinance. All in favor, please say aye. Oh, Mr. Aye. Mayor, I have just a little more discussion or oh, comment, sorry. if yeah. that's all right, before we take our yeah, final course, vote. Yeah, sorry. Um, I was again reminded uh, last week when I was out walking in neighborhoods registering voters how important people's pets are to them. Almost every single house that you go to either has a dog or a cat or a hamster. People love their pets. There's no doubt about this. These are like members of our family. It's part of our community. This ordinance that we're about to approve is a culmination of many, many hours of city staff work, um, resident input, and the city council considering this, running it through the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Um, and we know, as per the ballot initiative last year, that our community is split pretty much down the middle on this in terms of um, people who would prefer not to see uh, dogs on a leash. So we do certainly take this very, very seriously. This document, um, for me, is the best possible balanced approach that we can have at this time. And I just want to echo what Councilor Bates said that, um, you know, if we get into this three months and our police force is coming to us and saying, you know, we, we are just buried in tickets for this or we, we have to take another look at this or uh, the public health officer is saying, you know, we've had this many uh, incidents uh, that we may need to take public safety a little more seriously. Uh, I believe the future council will do that. Any other comments? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you all. Yeah, let's take a five minute break. Up again, we're going to take up item eight Black Lives Matter resolution and a racism discussion. Donna? Uh, I think this was a, you. Uh, I invite the superintendent and the high school principal to come forward. Yes. Yes. See, yeah, welcome. Thanks for having Is this me. your first time here? Yeah. In the first time great. Welcome. welcome. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is thrilled. Yeah. So I did mail the uh, proposed agenda sheet. I mean, and the proposed resolution. So you've seen it. And it, this is um, the attempt for City Council to support the Montpelier School System, the Montpelier High School Racial uh, Justice Alliance, and to support the Black Fly, Lives Matter flag, and that indeed we have to counter racism and any inequality that exists in our community as well as our schools. And so I'd just like to, you to share your personal experiences and what's been going on at the school, if you will. Yeah, so it's about a two-year process of us really waking up to uh, the privilege that we live with uh, in our school system and the implicit biases and the systemic racism. I don't think there's uh, any intention, malintention in our, in our school district, but there was enough vigilance to recognizing the implicit biases and, and the things that are just a part of our, our everyday, the everyday way, the way we were doing things on an everyday basis. And thanks to some very brave uh, young uh, leaders, courageous leader, leaders, um, they've helped us recognize uh, that we have growth to do. And so we have started that work, and it's a, it's a broad, systemic work for us. We have several. Um, professional development, uh, trainings for the adults, a lot of conversation with the students, and a concentration of effort this month in February. Uh, the most visible thing being the raising of the Black Lives Matter, or a Black Lives Matter flag, um, that the school board uh, voted to do unanimously after a uh, petition or request from the Racial Justice Alliance uh, of our students. Anything you want to add, maybe? I'm sorry, could you introduce yourself? Sorry, uh, I'm Michael Grath, I'm the high school principal. And my name is 
Mandin Salabuaziz, and Number South Monday High School. Welcome. I'm Brian Rick. I'm the superintendent of schools. And to echo <coughs> what Mike has been saying, um, it's really important that everyone understand that this work has been going on for two years and that the raising of a flag is not the culmination of the work, it's not the beginning of the work, it's not the end of the work. Um, our continuous improvement plan has three big goals. One of them is personalization, one of them is proficiency, and the other one is equity. So this work that we are doing, honoring the experience of our black students and admitting humbly that it's systematically different than the experience of our white students. Um, and so this is an effort to admit that we need to do better at being an inclusive community. Um, one of the things I say consistently, whether I'm talking to sophomores in high schools, in our high school, or, <clears throat> excuse me, kindergartners at our elementary school, is that my job is to work with all the adults in our building to make sure that all of our students can feel safe and included. Um, and this is just a way to honor the experience of our black students. And so um, we are grateful that um, the city council is having this conversation because um, we feel that we um, don't want to do this alone. This is not work that is only to be undertaken by the schools. This is to be undertaken by our entire community. So we're very buoyed by this conversation taking place at the city council. Thank you all for being here. I, I know for me it was just a wonderful thing to watch the emotion of the that event. I know it wasn't a culmination, but for the community it really was a centerpiece to, you know, a real statement to watch the emotion and the way the community supported it and then the statewide and then of course the, even the national attention it's brought has made me really proud to be part of Montpelier to be a, a leader and so I or not me but being a community that's leading and so thank you for taking that leadership role and and for the students for doing that I think it, you know for me it's just really eye-opening and and made me proud to be part of our community add to that um, some of the criticisms of this act uh, were that it was somehow anti-police and I just wanted to speak on behalf of Montpelier police that they were actively involved in this discussion the school resource officer the chief and supported it and showed up in large numbers on the day of the flag and I think stand with the students and the school in, um, in taking these actions and in doing the work going forward and so how people outside of our community may view this as one thing, but we all know that people here and the police officers here are on board. And to add to the city manager's comments, we also were very clear and reached out to the Vermont State Police as well. Um, they um, sent one officer for the ceremony as well. I've been in touch with Lieutenant Gary Scott, who I believe is the Director of Community and Fair Policing in Vermont, and he was very, very lauded. He lauded the effort of the students and absolutely understood the nuanced work that we were doing and, and also was not drawing any distinction that some members outside of this community and this state specifically were drawing um, when, it came, when it comes to flying a Black Lives Matter flag. So we were very thoughtful and intentional, Mike McCraith and I, in making sure that our law enforcement partners were aware of the context for what we were doing and why this was happening at this time. That round of applause really it should go to the students that were involved in nice. bringing this forward. And But Dr. Ricca, really I applaud yours and the principal's uh, acknowledgement of that and moving that forward. And you, as the mayor stated, really serve as leaders for us too in this uh, in terms of helping to inspire us uh, to, to stand together with our public schools. It's so important that our city do that. Um, also, I was particularly impressed in the letter that you wrote as a parent. I received that before this resolution came to us, and specifically um, how you acknowledged inherent bias and that it's real and we all have it. And to acknowledge that I think is huge and then to start to take steps to address that and correct that so that we have a system that's equitable for everybody. Um, I didn't know if you're help would help us better understand how we may as a city do better to do that by sharing a couple specific examples of the changes that you're either considering or already have made to improve your system yeah uh, thanks uh, I'll speak to that for a minute um, one of the things is is holding up a cultural competency lens to everything you're doing and for us that means instruction and our systems and making sure that we're well represented as uh, 
with the different voices and a variety of voices as much as we can. And uh, making sure that we honor this student voice and recognize uh, that our students of color um, need to be at this table um, and as much as possible. And uh, also just actual training. Um, Kathy Johnson is here, I think, uh, who's uh, from CQ Strategies, and we attended uh, the leadership team, the leaders uh, administration at the school, I attended uh, conferences with her, workshops with her, and we learned a great deal. Um, that is, was work for us as, as personal leaders and in our own work, um, and then also you know, holding that lens up to our systems and our decisions that we make. And I would encourage anyone in a leadership position to consider uh, learning from people who are doing this work on a regular basis as part of their career. There's a lot to be gained in that way. And uh, then there's, for us in the school system, uh, it's not as applicable, but there's, there's just content for us to understand ourselves and to expose ourselves to, and then also for our students. It's just choices and content that we can make. Uh, it's a pretty fundamental decision. One of the really shining examples of the inclusivity of the statement by the Racial Justice Alliance was that while it is a Black Lives Matter flag, the intent is to um, have all students feel included. And talking about implicit bias means talking about a lot of privilege. You know, um, I check a lot of boxes when it comes to privilege. I'm a white, able-bodied, cisgendered, heterosexual, Judeo-Christian male in a position of power. Um, there are not a lot of biases that are attached to me when I walk into a room, um, but that's not the experience of all of our students. It's probably not the experience of everybody in this room. And so one day uh, in January, Monday the 22nd, we had a, a workshop of professional development. It included people from outright Vermont talking about issues of sexual orientation and gender identity. It included people talking about disabilities, abilities and disabilities, ones that we can see and ones that we can't. We did have Kathy Johnson from CQ Strategies. And so the goal is to have all students feel that they can come to us with whomever they are, whether it's a visible bias implicit that we have when they show up in our classrooms or not, um, and that they all feel safe and included. And so our messaging has been around having conversations with families around what implicit bias and privilege is, and how, especially when Mike and I have had a lot of focus in these conversations, undressing ourselves, for lack of a better word, of the privilege that we come to the table with and ensuring that people like Mandy are sitting at the right tables and having the right conversations and that we honor those experiences. i just follow up on that too, that on a parallel track without knowing where the school was, the city leadership also team also did a four-hour workshop with Kathy Johnson and CQ Strategies about cultural competency earlier this winter just recognizing the same thing, our community is changing and we interact with police, fire, public works, ourselves in the offices, uh, our own staff, uh, to try to, to you know, raise our awareness of the same issues. And, uh, it's fascinating that this, you know, they, were, they were at the same place. So how do we get those workshops, not only for us as a council, but to the community, to really make them available to people? <laughs> there you go, Kathy. <laughs> well, Do you want to just come up and introduce yourself, Kathy, if you don't mind? We want to record you and hear your phone. Thank you. My name is Kathy Johnson, and I am part of a group called CQ Strategies. There's five of us. In fact, um, myself, Brian Sean, Dr. Smith, Jim Pino, and Paul Smith. So, not here. Um, we do have some um, trainings that are going to be <coughs> Our education system to this level, and I have never heard. 
Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I wonder if we can make some sort of a link with some of these events on the city website. Sure, we'd be happy Under to. title, I mean, because people see it, but they don't see it. Do you know what I mean? So that would be good. Thank you. Thank you. Done. Something that happened Monday at Rotary, we had our regular annual speech contest, and there were Montpelier High School students who talked, and one chose the BLM flag raising and behind it. And she gave this example. She says, sometimes when you talk about black lives matter, people will say, all lives matter, which is true. And she made this wonderful comparison. If you had a neighborhood of 20 houses, and one is on fire, where are you going to put your attention? And when you put your attention on the house that's burning, everything you learn about that, you can hopefully apply to the other houses. So it is very inclusive. Isn't that an example? I just love it. I mean, it's a very inclusive Should approach. Have sprinkled it. It's <laughs> never exclusive. <laughs> it's, I was just, it's just very touching. It's just very touching. Do we need the resolution read out loud? No, I don't think so. I mean, okay. um, I'd love to make a, a comment as well. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah. So, uh, in addition to raising the Black Lives Matter, <coughs> I think one of the um, most impactful things for me as a part of, uh, so I'm a teacher at the high school, so one of the things that I found um, really moving actually was uh, hearing from the, the very brave students of the Racial Justice Alliance reflecting back to the teachers um, at various occasions actually what their experience has been like and how uh, really bringing really specific examples um, as to how their experience has, has been different um, than the, the white students at, at the school and so that has got me uh, thinking quite a bit about the city in general I mean obviously if uh, blacks and students of color uh, at the school are having a, a, a systematically different experience at the school then must they also you know obviously they're having a different experience in our community as well and how lucky you know the, the school is to have uh, such great students who are willing to take that risk um, and and call you know shine a light on on those um, on those experiences and uh, one of the things that I, I would love to see us do um, as a as a body, you know, the council is to, uh, I mean, I know there are a number of groups uh, in the community that, that work on, on racial justice issues, and I, I would love to have, you know, CQ st strategies or other, uh, you know, cultural competency groups, um, you know, do that work for the council as, as well, um, to put that on the radar, but also just wanted, um, I'd love to start the conversation as to how do we invite groups that are doing racial justice work in our community, um, highlight for us how their experiences are different and what we can be doing um, about about those things. I mean, I know as a, as a teacher, um, hearing about those experiences uh, has you know, really made me think about my curriculum in, in, in new ways, and uh, it's been really helpful. So. Uh, and I would love to see us, like again, as Kathy said, we don't know what we don't know um, about how that is experienced by um, people of color in our community. Our, I guess how our, our city systems are experienced differently uh, by people of color. So I just want to put that out there. Um, I'd love to start that dialogue. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm just the secretary up here, but. I'm, my friends all over the country are talking about this. So outside the school, I mean, you all have, the students have done a great job, I think, reminding, if I can be blunt, reminding white America that not everything is about us and how black and brown communities and groups choose to express their experiences and their concerns is never subject to our approval. So thank you. Um, you know, uh, as Justin said, you know, the, the first and highest uh, thanks is to the students, but I also just want to acknowledge the school board um, and their risk taking um, to approve the flying of the Black Lives Matter flag because I know um, that is effectively their uh, their jurisdiction to do that, and that that was they've caught some flack for that too. So. Thank you. Donna. Can I make a motion Please. that we adopt the resolution? Please. To the chorus. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I 
don't think we need to. Okay. But yeah, it, I mean, it's up to you. But I, think. I would prefer we do. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Sure. On February 1, 2018, a Black Lives Matter flag was raised at Montpelier High School to fly for the month of February. The Montpelier School Board approved the request for the Montpelier High School students of the Racial Justice Alliance to fly, raise the flag. The school board stated they are committed to making our schools inclusive, to combating institutional racism, and to work towards equality for every student. At the flag raising, students spoke out about prejudice and racism in our schools and our community. And whereas students have spoke out about prejudice and racism experienced in our schools and our community, and whereas Montpelier prides itself in being an inclusive, welcoming community, and be it resolved that the Montpelier City Council supports the Montpelier Public Schools in their raising of the Black Lives Matter flag, be it further resolved that the Montpelier City Council rejects all forms of racism, bigotry, and hate, and seeks to work together to combat these issues in our community. And be it further resolved that the Montpelier City Council is committed to inclusion and equality as a foundation of our community and encourage residents to support this commitment. Signing by the majority of the councils, it will signify going forth with the above. Okay. Thank you, Donna. And so take that a motion? Yeah, motion. Approved? Okay. I'll second. <laughs> okay. Uh, any further discussion? So, um, Present. I just wanted to um, mention that while I want us as a council to be really open, um, if um, people of color or other minorities want to share their experience with us about what it's different, how different it is to live in our community, I don't want to put that burden on them to express that to us. Um, it's that's a, a a further hardship to put on that community, and um, so it's incumbent on us to do that work ourselves. Um, and of course, if, if folks want to share their experience with us, that's always open and always welcome. Um, but that we're not relying on people saying, "Hey, this is a problem," in order for us to see that that we're seeking that out. Um, so, thank you, Rosie. Further discussion. All right, hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, thank you all very much. Thanks if, for having if me. If I could. Okay. If I could just have one, one of minute. Of course, yeah. yeah. So uh, I would just like to say thank you um, to all of you. It means a great deal when, you, when you're, uh, this has been quite an experience for all of us, and, and I'd like to thank the students again for their leadership. And when you are experiencing the vulnerability that our, uh, our students with far less privilege than what I've grown up with and lived with experience on a regular basis, but when you experience that firsthand and some of the, the hate that, go, that goes along with that, being <clears throat> lifted up by a, a community uh, means a great deal to me personally. And I just personally want to thank the people of Montpelier that when there was vulnerability and, and hate coming at our high school and at, at our community, um, they stood up with, with love and, and strength in their voices. And I want to thank this uh, city council and all the people of Montpelier for, for their solidarity and their support. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item, uh, number nine, continuation of our discussion about the sprinkler ordinance. So I guess we're on the yeah, second reading, and we, when we adjourned, we had a motion that was pending by Councillor Olson, and I think she wanted to modify that. So, Jean, i call on you. Yes, thank you. Um, we laid my motion to repeal the current sprinkler ordinance on the table at our most recent meeting, and I now move to, to take it up. Further, I intend to clarify my motion by saying it is not my intention to repeal the entire ordinance, but to repeal the requirement to sprinkle new one and two family homes. Okay, so, so with so that objection, I would, I would propose that we substitute Jean's motion that she just described for the one that is pending uh, when we last adjourned. So, to so just to clarify, Rosie. this would be the amendments that the ordinance, that the <coughs> committee proposed, less the section that says one and two family homes. Yes. Yeah.
Okay, so that's the pending motion. Now, I don't, was that seconded, John? Do we, or it I mean, was, was yes. Yeah, so we were, on, okay, so we're on discussion regarding that motion now. And yes, uh, were there other process questions, John, that you wanted to address that are relevant at this point in terms yeah, of how to I proceed? Okay, uh, comments, questions? Yes, uh, so Rosie. I just Rosie. wanted to express, Ashley, Councillor Hill was not um, able to be here tonight for a medical reason, um, but I did check in with her um, because she had expressed at the last meeting um, that she was still formulating an opinion, um, and she said that um, basically she agreed with the, the um, proposal that, that Jean just put on the table that um, agreed with the amendments that the um, ordinance committee had proposed but um, would like to strike the one and two family section. So just wanted to um, pass on those comments on behalf okay. of council. Thank you, Rosie. All right, so we probably have, I know we have a few folks probably want to comment, anybody from the council and then the public. So I guess in no particular order, do you want to go first, Bob? I think or, the, or the, the staff members would like to make it just a brief last okay. shot at okay. it. All right. And, uh, well, and we'll, we will make it brief. We'll, okay, we'll try to. Just, just a reminder, because at 10, or 10-10, the U.S. women's hockey team <laughs> has a very important game tonight versus Canada. All yeah. right. And that right. game is live on NSNBC, Excellent. 10 o'clock, <laughs> U.S. versus Canada. So your native Amanda Pelkey. Yeah. Right. There you go. So, so we do need to be home by 10. The school may have their Black Lives Matter flag, but we've got the Olympic flag. Right, right we have the Olympic flag. So, <laughs> all right. So I, I hand it. I want to talk. Chris and I both want to talk strictly about the one and two family um, piece tonight. Uh, I handed out some information tonight to everybody. From most of that came uh, directly <coughs> from the NFPA, and we'll just I'll quickly go through it. Um, I, I, you know, I don't read, need to read it all word for word. You know, the gist of it is there. there the NFP, um, did a, NFPA did a survey on the five-year period from 2011 to 2016. And you can see there are um, almost 400,000 home fires. 350,000 of those didn't have sprinklers. I think what stands out in there, though, is that in, in those fires, there were 2,600 civilian fire deaths, um, 13,000 civilian injuries. 7.2 billion in direct property damage and 25,600 firefighter injuries at the fire ground in those years. And those were just at at um, single family home fires. You go down, you know, sprinklers reduce, I went through this last week, reduce the death, the risk of dying in a home fire by 80%. Working smoke detectors alone reduce um, the risk of dying in home fire by 50%. And in a few minutes, Chris is gonna talk about what work working smoke detectors, because we're not seeing working smoke detectors. Sprinklers are responsible for 65% reduction in firefighter injuries. Um, and keeping in mind, this is all in one and two family homes. Sprinklers reduce the average property loss per home by 70%. Sprinklers reduce civilian fire injuries, medical costs by 53%. The, you know, the, the numbers are there, the, the, the information is there. A uh, 2008 Underwriters Laboratory study found, you know, fire fat because of um, the synthetic construction of today's home furnishings, uh, larger homes, open spaces, increased fuel loads that uh, faster fire propagation, meaning that from when it first starts till it grows into that incipient stage much quicker, shorter time to flash over, rapid change in fire dynamics. Shorter escape time, shorter time in building collapse. And on cost quickly, uh, the average cost for a sprinkler in Montpelier um, is about $8,200. Uh, those aren't numbers we made up. Those are real numbers. Chris will go through in a few minutes how we, how we came up with those numbers. He, he came up with those using actual permits. And if all that isn't enough in safety, there's incentives. In Montpelier, we're offered 10% reduction in the municipal portion of your tax obligation on a fully sprinkled property. And the ISO, the ISO is an independent insurance organization that does assessments. Um, they do they, they they assess the city of Montpelier. We we get a rating every every five years. They come in and they do a rating for us. 
uh, they did an assessment report and they found uh, insurance discounts, and this is nationwide, uh, ranging in 0 to 12 percent with an average of 7 percent. So, you know, and, and then there's the other fact sheets to go with it. I'm not going to go through all those with you. What I would like to do, though, is just stop real quickly, and we have a video, very short, put out by the NFPA. It's three minutes, three and a half minutes, but it's pretty compelling. And uh, so I, I would like everyone to take a look at this. Image that's on the screen. <laughs> it's right there. I just don't know why it's not showing. The source of the device. Show on the screen though. You know what? No? Okay. Well, it was a really good video. Maybe you can act it out for us. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a demonstration of two identical rooms, uh, 10, 10 by 10, uh, built at the laboratory, uh, furnished exactly the same. Fur same exact furniture, same exact stuffed animals, and they lit the one on the right on fire. It was not sprinkled, and you can see how rapidly the fire builds. It goes to flash over, and then uh, the fire department comes in and puts it out. The second one is sprinkled, um, and boy, I wish I had the time. Within uh, you know a minute to a minute and a half, the fire was completely extinguished. There was no destruction in the room. There was no. It, it's a very good video. I wish we had it, but we don't. So, can you send That's us okay. the link? Yeah, that'd be yeah, great. I can, uh, we'll send it out. Sure. All right, so I'm going to let Chris talk a little bit, and then I, I'll finish up with a couple quick things. And sure. Uh, so the the average cost of sprinklers, Chief alluded to it, it's around eighty-two hundred dollars, um, and that was a sample of 14, 14 fairly recent projects, single-family homes, and the cost of the sprinkler as reported on the certification form that's submitted at the end of the project. Um, the most expensive sprinkler system of those 14 was $10,850. The least expensive was $4,500. Uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five. Five of those sprinkler systems, I believe that cost included the cost of a pump and tank because they didn't have an adequate water system. The, the pump and tank out, add about $2,000 to the cost of a sprinkler system. So that, that's kind of where those numbers came from local historical data. Um, Chief also mentioned working smoke alarms. Um, so in, in the course of my job, people will renovate a bathroom or, or do a smaller project in their home. When I'm in their homes, I, I do my very best to take that opportunity to review their smoke alarms and make sure they've got good working smoke alarms. And it's, it's surprising to me the number of homes People who are our friends and neighbors and intelligent professional people, you go in these homes and the, the smoke alarms are down. There's, there's wires hanging out of the box where the smoke alarm should be. The smoke alarm that, if it works, would give early warning to get these people up and out of their houses. And then I'll ask them, where's your smoke alarm? Well, you know, it was chirping or maybe it needed a battery or it was malfunctioning. So we took it down and we were going to put it right back up. And 
you know, a month has passed since, since that's happened. It's, it's, it's frightening to see that. So the smoke alarms do provide early warning when they're in place, when they're functioning properly, and they're maintained, but that's not what we always find, and I'm sure the chief has similar stories from the duty crews going out for various various calls. Um, and one one other thing I'd like to share with you, I have uh, <clears throat> have an email from a local builder who has very recently built a house in Montpelier, uh, and I'll just I'll just read it to you. My name is Will Shabom, and I'm a general contractor here in town. I built my own home last winter on North Street and moved in in March. Having recently gone through the process of having to install a sprinkler in my home, here are my thoughts. Would I have installed one if I hadn't been forced to? Hard to say, but now that I have one, I feel pretty good knowing that my home is safe from fire and not dependent on anything other than the city water system maintaining adequate pressure. I have a challenging driveway that could be potentially tricky for fire trucks at certain times of the year. My house is also fairly far away from the street at an uphill incline, so there's another reason the sprinkler makes sense. In terms of cost, to sprinkle my entire house, just over 2,000 square feet cost only $6,000. I don't know where the sprinkler cost quotes of $30,000 are coming from. The cost of having a sprinkler certainly didn't prohibit me from building my house. All in all, my thoughts in regards to the ordinance is that it shouldn't be some carpet policy that is black and white. It seems that it should be on a case-by-case -case basis. Certain factors such as proximity to other buildings, fire vehicle access, water pressure, town water or well, number of dwelling units, etc., etc. Pretty much what I would have said in person. So that's what I have to add in discussion. Thank you for your time. Thank you for this. All right, I have just a couple other things. Um, just want to clarify one that Montpelier is not, we keep hearing Montpelier is the only community in Vermont with a residential sprinkle ordinance. We are not. The town of Hartford has a, a residential one and two family sprinkler ordinance, and it also includes parts of Queechee. It's a little different than ours. It's enforced through the planning and zoning department. And, and the, the way this, their sprinkler, so it's not an ordinance. It's, it's in their uh, planning and zoning. And the way that works is if you build a house in uh, Hartford or Queechee, and you're more than 500 feet from the nearest hydrant, you have you have two choices. You can either install your own hydrant attached to a 3,500-gallon uh, underground tank, so you built in your own. You can get a variance from that, and the variance is that you sprinkle your home. So the variance for not putting in your own hydrant is you sprinkle a home. They, there's a, or it's not an ordinance, but it, it's been in effect for 18 years, and there are 100 homes, the, the fleet, uh, talked to the fire chief this week, there's about 100 homes in Norwich and Queechee that are sprinkled. So it's, it's, it's not something new to Mont. we're not to. So I thought that was important. And then I just want to point out um, on the federal tax reform, I think I sent that to everybody, I even highlighted it. And if we look down on the cost recovery section, it clearly states, under the new law, any sprinkler system installed after September 27, 17, in either a commercial or residential structure until December 31st will be, uh, you know, fully expensed. That's what the tax reform says. I've been in a number of discussions recently, including today, uh, with a gentleman by the name of Jeff Howard. Jeff is from the NFPA. He's, uh, he's out in Kansas City, and he's a sprinkler administrator. He cannot, uh, and, you know, I'm here to tell you it's nice. He cannot say for sure that that is going to cover single-family homes. So we, we want to make sure everyone knows that. There's a lot of question about it. You know, as we all know, the, this tax reform was probably, there were probably many promises made throughout the process of putting that together that will never come to fruition. It does say residential. The NFPA is saying that may not include single-family homes. That would be a huge undertaking. And when it was, when that legislation was worded, they probably, he said, they probably didn't realize what they were saying. It's still up in the air. It may, it may not. But tonight, I can't sit here and tell you that single-family homes will be uh, fall into this because they may not. 
Okay. Any questions for Bob or Chris? Okay, comments. So, for the public. Can I, actually, uh, can I ask Chris? Yes, sir. Um, something that I, so I guess we're just talking about single family homes right now, but something that I found extremely helpful during our process was um, when you discussed uh, how our ordinance was different from the state um, with regard to public buildings, not to single family homes. So, we don't have to do it right now, but we can do on this grand thought, but I would like to have Chris explain that to the rest of the council um, before we finish tonight, just because that was really I don't know. Would, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. You asked for something on this topic tonight, then now would be the time. We should continue on the, the one and two family homes, but then I want to put a place marker in there to, to talk about um, public buildings as well. Here. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Other questions? Uh, Sandy, did you want to comment? Thank you for taking public comments on this. Um, I am here to talk about the suggested. Can you hear me? Um, I've been a, my name is Sandy Vinston. I live on Loomis Street. I've been a resident for 25 years. I own a multi-family historic dwelling that's 175 years old. And um, the last unit that went in there was about uh, two years ago that Chris helped me with. And I'm also an architect. I've been practicing in Montpelier for 25 years. So I remember when this ordinance was passed. The first thing I want to say is that we have an excellent team of first responders. And the last thing I would want to do as a resident is put them in additional harm. That's a really serious um, concern, as well as the welfare of our families in Montpelier. We also have an excellent building department. And when I was working on my own house, learning from uh, two to kind of two and a half units, um, Chris was extremely accommodating. And in fact, I worked with him and the state to figure out how to make it work in my house. I do not have sprinklers in my house. Um, I want to point out with my professional background and just personal experience, a couple things. Um, and they're not meant to in any way downplay the, the importance of what we already have in place. just want to offer a couple of different perspectives on some of these uh, facets this issue. Um, I find the other measures that are in different ordinances, building codes, to be extremely useful for saving lives. And the most important one is, without a doubt, smoke detectors. Right after that, carbon monoxide detectors. And if they can be hardwired, that's really important. I am guilty of leaving detectors without batteries for a month or two until I went to the store. And I um, was immediately bugged a few months ago by my hardwire detector down in the basement, letting me know that the dust in the basement had caused it to not function anymore. And I wasn't going to be able to sleep that night until I fixed it. I think hardwiring is probably one of the most important things that we can do. The other thing is to enforce that there are two exits from basically every area of a home where people sleep. Um, the deaths that did happen, in recent history were because uh, a couple got stuck down in the basement and the stairs out were the only exit and they couldn't get to the stairs. Um, bedrooms, windows, so forth. Um, so these other measures um, are definitely enhanced by sprinklers, but in the balance of things, I, I'd like just to keep in mind that these other measures, I think, add up to a lot in themselves. I briefly want to point out that my oldest son nearly died in a college dorm. Uh, we we'll call it let's we'll call it a smolder, Alex. Uh, freshman year, three boys were sleeping in a room. One drunk roommate somehow ignited his pillow, and it smoldered. And he threw it off his bed onto the floor, and it smoldered for over an hour, and they almost died. That room happened to not have smoke detectors working and it didn't set off the sprinklers because there wasn't enough heat. So um, thank heavens, one of the boys happened to wake up and they threw the pillow out doors and it spontaneously combusted. Um, the school was never uh, investigated for not having the smoke detectors, but I just want to point out in that case, that would have been what would have saved their lives if they had functioning smoke detectors. 
Um, I want to point out that the International Residential Code is a companion code to the um, National Fire, uh, oh gosh, NFPA, National Fire Protection Administrators. Um, and in fact, the NFPA in Vermont is dominant over the IRC, but the IRC is a standard for many states in the United States, um, and it does not require um, sprinkler systems for single family homes. I also want to point out that, um, uh, so, so I guess I would say from a, a national point, it, it's a little bit above and beyond what's considered normal care, standard of care. And um, I'm sure that the chief's statistics are more updated than mine, but when I talked to my insurance agent a few years ago, because I was trying to figure this out, there was no discount offer for having a sprinkler system. And we talked about it, and there's so many malfunctions that can happen, particularly in Vermont where we get very cold weather, that we thought that maybe it was that the potential for malfunctions can offset the pot potential for safe lives and safe uh, furnishings and so forth. Um, and in fact, one day I was in the insurance agent's office and a woman was making a claim for her child, again, another dorm situation, where $1.6 million damage was caused by the sprinklers going off in the dorm due to popcorn and microwave. And it's one point, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of damage that can happen from now. It doesn't mean that they're bad, but just it, it's another facet of the issue. Um, I really personally hope that we could encourage more incentives rather than making it a regulation to have a sprinkler system in every new home, but have an incentive at, at the town level, city level. Um, I think having one at the federal level would be fantastic. I'd like to see um, us approach it that way rather than uh, making it absolutely required. And the reason is, well, there are there are a lot of reasons, but I guess it gets down to economics. Um, the cost, $10,000 or $8,000, can make a big difference. And when a family is deciding where to build and they're trying to balance taxes, property taxes, frankly, I've heard from a number of people that's the one of the reasons why they choose to live outside of their town, even though they know that their car expenses will be much higher and they won't be going to such a great school, but they will choose to live outside of Montpelier, um, it's not, a well, one-time investment of $8,000 is not huge. You're already spending two to three hundred half thousand on a house. But that is one factor. Um, it's a complicated issue, and there are many nuances to it. So I, anyways, I just wanted to give a couple more perspectives. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you, Kate. Other comments?
cost of the sprinkler system, although it's significant one, it's probably for most people are willing to go to that end and not going to make or break uh, decision. However, it does contribute to a series of challenges to the cost of building. Um, don't actually Obviously, a lot of stated and clear benefits to having a sprinkler system. Well, ultimately, as a community, it seems to come down to the cost and the benefit and the values. I don't know uh, how able any of the council members have been able to uh, query their constituencies. I think you might find that a lot of folks in the world know that this is the way that it exists. Uh, for me personally, I'm happy to do it. I'm probably about six weeks away from having a sprinkler Thank you. Other comments? Okay, so we have a motion pending, and just for clarity, it was a motion to adopt the proposed changes with the exception of uh, one and two units, family units, is that right? So it's an all encompassing yes, motion. To, to repeal the, the requirements <coughs> But also was adopting the propo proposed yeah. adopting. Can I ask that we split those? Um, I would prefer to vote on whether to remove the one and two family from the amendment um, and then do a second vote on whether to adopt the amendment, whether or not we change it. Yeah, I think that's an order. I think you can call it uh, to divide the question. Um, okay, so any further discussion? If not, we'll hear the first motion first. Uh, so yes. I, I, oh. I've got further discussion. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, on the variant uh, on the ordinance committee we did struggle with a lot of these issues um, that the public has raised and we went through a lot of them um, and I still stand behind what we presented to you um, I suspect that the majority of the council is going to vote to um, repeal the the one and two family um, exemption and that's certainly a policy decision that we can make um, I personally am not going to uh, vote to support removing one and two family, although I will vote to um, make the, the total amendments um, because I, I um, one, having gone through that process and thought thoroughly about all this, but um, second, uh, having a personal experience several weeks ago where a, a colleague um, that I had worked with previously and his four-year-old son were killed in a single family house fire as they were trying to escape. And that experience just really you know, brought it home to me how um, these fires can strike anybody, um, and we, when you're designing a house, you're thinking about you know your dreams for that house and how you're going to live there, and you don't think about these sorts of situations. Um, so that was a, a personal um, experience that I had recently, and I, because of that, can't vote to support um, exempting that. Um, but pragmatically, um, I share the frustrations that um, we heard from a contractor um, that the ordinance as it's currently written um, is being applied unequally um, and I think that an ordinance uh, even without the, the one and two family homes um, change that we have presented is better than what's on the books currently. So I just wanted to yeah. say that piece. Thank you Rosie. Other comments? Okay. If not um, then. Oh. Oh. Yeah. yeah um, I guess I just would uh, add that I uh, I mean, having heard uh, from uh, you know a developer who 
is grateful <coughs> to have uh, uh, a sprinkler system in his house. I think is, is really it's just really interesting, you know, that it's not um, uh, all black and white, you know, uh, as to uh, you know how people feel about this. And you know, if for for people that are spending on the scale of uh, you know four to eight thousand dollars. I mean, that seems reasonable. I did talk with a friend of mine who is spending thirty thousand dollars on a sprinkler system, and that to me seems unreasonable. Um, and so my hope, I mean, so I, I also want to take a, a rational um, approach to this process, and that um, one of the things that I think we, I would be very interested in seeing is as if uh, I, I may also, um, I'm, I'm glad that we're separating these things out because um, I'm also not going to support um, exempting the one and two family homes, but I would also um, vote to uh, pass the amendment if that's what, what people want. Um, but uh, I guess jumping jumping back to my, my thought here, um, I, I feel like uh, I have lost my train of thought. <laughs> So maybe I'll, I'll leave it there. Right. Oh, right. Uh, the uh, because this uh, amendment does have cost provisions as grounds for exemption. My hope is that that works. And um, if it doesn't work, then that means the amendment hasn't worked, and then it's worth taking up again. So I I would really like to um, monitor how the um, how that how that goes and. Uh, you know, if someone's needing to spend uh, thirty thousand dollars on a sprinkler system, I would I would hope that they would get um, you know a variance uh, to not have one. So, yeah, let's let's keep watching it. I don't. I mean, I've had more conversations about sprinklers than I thought I would ever have in my life um, uh, <laughs> because of, of this. Um, and and I also want to acknowledge that we might not be done uh, with this, and that's okay. Uh, I'm. I'm interested to see how well this works. Um, and if it doesn't work, let's take it up again. For discussion. All right, hearing none, uh, we're voting on the motion by um, Councilor Olson to remove, uh, I'm sorry, it's like, uh, uh, single uh, two unit uh, dwellings. Just for the sake of clarity, um, there's just there's this one section that says new one or two family dwellings, and that's what would be struck in its entirety. Mm -hmm. Everything else would stay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know you're only voting on the first part right now, but just including the exempt structures is that part. Of, so, in part, I was thinking that if you take out the the one and two family homes, the exempt structures <coughs> almost doesn't make. It does. Do, do you think it makes sense? Okay. So that was something that. Is there a question? Did you want to raise a question? <laughs> No, we're voting. You're voting on right now to uh, repeal, the, remove the requirement for sprinkling for for one and two for one and two family dwellings. You want to say something? No, I think that's great. Okay. Great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all, in, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Okay. So vote is three two, and that passes. And then the motion is. Yeah, a four. You got to have to. Oh, we have four. Okay, so I vote. Vote. I vote. I vote aye as well. Forget that. It's four votes. Um, uh, second, uh, and so now we're, <laughs> you can probably tell, I've been, uh, my brain is a little fogged. You're Recovering well. from the flu here. So we're dealing with the, un now we have the underlying motion to, uh, uh, which is proposed to, um, uh, as proposed by the committee. Yeah, there's no underlying motion. Well, they split. Actually, split she was, it was part of it, so we just divide, we divided it. So we Jean, it was it. part of Gene's original motion. motion. Right, so now we're on the second. The same uh, vote. So they need to state it. Passing and, or oh, no, we're not voting second. it at the same time. But it's no, but, I mean, but it's parliamentary speaking. It's two different motions, so I'm just making sure that then it's got the same first and second. Sure. It sounds like the assumption is. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Everybody understand where you are? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Actually, aye. is there uh, time for discussion on this? Yes, yeah, sure. Because um, now we're talking generally about the work that this committee has done um, with the removal of single and two family homes. I wanted to follow up on a point that Councillor Watson made, which is uh, specifically 
um, towards the end of the document um, in section 201-5A, which covers variants. Um, and in reading this, um, number three, unreasonable cost burden, uh, stuck out to me, because what does that mean? Part of what we've struggled with in the building code committee previously was a certain amount of ambiguity over um, how we should implement uh, the rules that were before us, and so it seems to me it would make sense to provide as much clarity as possible, if it's appropriate, um, to help maybe define that. And um, sounds like there may be more work to be done on this in the future, but since we have it open now, I'm going to take a stab at it. Um, in talking to a developer, there were a couple things that came up in terms of the cost of these systems. Um, the first is adequate water pressure, and that is addressed further down number four, also in variances. And I guess it would help me to have a little bit more information about what is the PSI or the metric by which we're um, it, sprinkler systems function properly. It's, vol it's actually volume and not pressure. Okay. And that's where we, and, and there are some issues in the city where there's not enough volume. So we have plenty of pressure in the city. There's areas where we don't have enough because of old, Harrison Avenue was a perfect example. Um, and until this past summer when they put in the new water line, there was not enough volume there. And um, so what is that volume? They throw out 3,500 gallons or what it, is the volume? It depends yeah. entirely on the on number of square footage. Uh, not just square footage, but contents of the building, design of the sprinkler system, pipe lengths. It, there's uh, uh, sprinkler systems are hydraulically calculated and they're based on a certain amount of water hitting the floor at all locations and effectively that means you start building the system at the very end. You have to supply the right amount of water to the very end of it and backtrack that all the way to the beginning. Um, so there, there's sure. not one number there. So if I'm understanding correctly, there's both the uh, volume and pressure that's coming out of the city supply line and then um, the system itself within the house based on square footage, length of pipe, et cetera, et cetera. Is that more or less we're, we're but to be it. clear my, my understanding is that the council has struck the one and two family sprinkler requirement so now we're talking about commercial sprinklers which is an NFPA 13 system which requires significantly more water than, <coughs> than a single family home sure if you ask me the question about a single family home I'd say 35 to 35 uh, gallons per minute is how much how much a single family home sprinkler typically requires. More for, depending on the structure. So I guess much, much more for kind of where I'm going with this is who will be making that determination of adequate city water supply based on all those variables? Uh, well, when a, when a sprinkler system is designed, Public Works flows, flows water from the two hydrants closest to, closest to where that sprinkler system is going to be connected, and that's going to determine what, what city water we have supplied at that location. That's not okay. not saying that's supplied into the building. It's what's in the street in front of that property. So DPW will conduct tests and then uh, report back in the permitting process as to whether there is sufficient fire suppression. The sprinkler sprinkler supply supply use that information. On site. Okay. That's helpful, I think, for whoever on building code ends up trying to help make these rulings in a fair and predictable way. Um, and that brings us back to unreasonable cost burden. So. You know, we've thrown out the number 4,000, 10,000, 30,000. There's, there's some spectrum of what this council might um, perceive as acceptable. And of course, uh, the majority of anything above 10,000 is when you get into insufficient supply, and then you need pressure tanks and, and reserves on site to help ensure that there is uh, adequate water to put out the fire. Um, and I'm curious if there's any uh, tolerance in council to uh, try to quantify that perhaps with a, a cost per square foot of development because obviously as Chris referenced the size of the building and the number of live, the floors of living space uh, would contribute to the amount of sprinkling that it needs and thus the cost of the system. So I'd like to respond to that. Um, we did discuss in the committee trying to make these um, variance criteria more specific um, and we did start to go down that road and then we really kind of took a step back and realized that looking at the variances that the uh, variance committee has granted over the past few years, um, regardless of whether they should have been granted or not um, under that previous ordinance, um, there were 
so many different factors going into whether or not it was a reasonable cost. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that really springs to mind, especially now that we're just talking about public buildings, we're not talking about single family homes, is um, when the um, homeless shelter was being proposed uh, for the church this past fall. Um, and that was a situation where they weren't actually doing a whole lot of construction, it was really a change of use situation. And they counted as a hotel. Um, and so technically, you know, we would, for a normal hotel, of course we would want a sprinkler system. Um, but, you know, I sat on the, the variance committee with you and um, even though we didn't have a clear path in the ordinance to exempt them, we did not want to have the sprinkler requirement be the one thing to stand in the way of us having a homeless shelter in Montpelier. That just w did not seem to be the intention. Um, and so we granted them a, a one year variance um, with the knowledge that we were working on this and, and would um, have something going forward. So in that situation, even a very low cost burden, even a low, very low cost per square footage would have been unreasonable for that situation. Um, if somebody was putting in a brand new hotel, then we would be considering a much higher cost per square foot as reasonable or unreasonable. And so, um, you know, this council appoints the members of the sprinkler variance committee. And um, to some extent, you know, we have to give them the tools to figure this out and make that determination. And that was where the committee ended up um, in leaving it a little um, variable there. Sure, I appreciate that it was discussed and also um, that certainly there is a place for some level of ambiguity. I guess I just kind of wanted to test the waters in terms of, you know, does that mean that if someone has more or less money when they start their construction project, if that would impact that decision or the number of square footage of the house? I mean, could they just build, if they build a smaller house, I mean, we're house in, will in, be included now. Or a, a building, a, a residential multifamily unit, maybe. Um, probably the fall under state. Fall under the state. And our in mind now that we're removing the single one and two family homes, most of the projects are going to fall under the state now. The hotels, the and uh, three or more units, and a residential falls to the state. So if we go back a little bit then in the document to just before one and two family dwellings in terms of uh, new multifamily buildings. Um, in saying that the state would cover those, that, that's pretty clearly stated here in the first part of the sentence, in addition to the provisions of the Vermont Fire and Building Safety Code, and it goes on to say, in what we're preparing to consider approval for, an approved automatic sprinkler system must be installed in resident occupancies up to and including four stories in height and in accordance with NFPA 13R. Is that a more stringent requirement than state requirements? Um, yes, it is. Yeah. So, so even though state um, law would apply, we're now proposing it a can, it can be an ordinance that potentially is is uh, a greater burden to a developer. That's, that's one of the windows of areas that a variance could be considered. Um, I would like to suggest, uh, just looking at these exempt structures and how we've structured it, given that the council has expressed a preference to remove one and two family, it probably makes sense to add one and two family dwellings as a line under exempt structures just so that there's no ambiguity. Um, that would make this clearer. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to make that motion, but if somebody <laughs> would like to make that motion, that would make your ordinance sit. <laughs> I guess my intent in raising this is just to make sure that we're getting this right. If we have, uh, you know, variances one through four with things like uh, low risk occupancy, alternative compliance measures, unreasonable cost burden, and inadequate city, city water. There's a lot of ways to get out of this if you wanted, if you met these criteria as determined by this rather subjective body. That was my only point raising this. Okay, any further discussion? All right, here's them. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you all for your work on this uh, <laughs> issue. <laughs> We've all lost energy. We can't open our mouths, John. Okay. The next and final item is the discussion of the Taylor Street Art Project. <laughs> Beauty at last. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Welcome. 
Uh, so we have two members of the committee, uh, Nathan Souter and Jill Praley, and, and then um, Paul Gamble, who has uh, been responsible for organizing this process and running the city's grant. So welcome both of you and Jill. It's been a pleasure to spend this evening with you. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. I was going to remind you, you could watch on TV. And happy, then, uh, happy to be at the round table. Um, thank you. Uh, we're excited to be here at this moment. I'm just going to give a, a very short introduction. And I, it has not escaped me uh, that on this special day, uh, Montpelier wakes up and celebrates a very precious expression of public art that has become renowned as a part of our identity in Montpelier all over the country. People know about the Phantom and its impact, and I have heard it, it's in the air that there are over 5,000 hearts this year all over Montpelier. And I want to point out also that uh, thrilled that somehow the Phantom and the Art Synergy Project got connected this year. And you'll notice there are 200 custom-made hearts that are love letters to Montpelier created by students at the high school and Union Elementary that somehow made it into the hands of the Phantom and into the distribution. Uh, so we're thrilled that the city uh, of all stakeholders are celebrating the power of public art. And to just connect the dots, one more level, it, it really, uh, I don't think anybody who saw the hearts taped to the flagpole <coughs> and on the high school the day after the Black Lives Matter flag went up uh, can, can cannot acknowledge that that expression of art and messaging through imagery has become part of, of the actual soul of Montpelier. So this project, creating a, a path to annually supporting a cultural commitment to creating our identity through art should not be uh, discounted or, or uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lost for the word here, but there's real power in what we're about to do. And, and tonight, this announcement is the very beginning of what we hope will become an annual expression of Montpelier's identity through public art. So, uh, we've had a wonderful process led by Nathan Souter, who's been chair of the committee, and I'm going to hand it over to him to tell you about that process. And then we do have a recommendation, uh, which we'd like to discuss uh, probably in an executive session. Uh, I want to echo Paul's uh, appreciation for spending the evening with you, uh, especially this is uh, today's my birthday. <laughs> I, can, I can think of no better way to spend my birthday evening. Um, and my wife tries. is very happy. Nice happy birthday. Um, putting the kids to bed by herself. <laughs> um, uh, Paul, I think that was a great articulation about the, the Valentine Bandit. The, uh, I share Paul's appreciation for the power of art in the public space. And um, I love that we are cheek by jowl with a sprinkler discussion, and I was going to make some argument that art also makes us safer. Um, I do think that this is, uh, Montpelier already has a unique ident identity, and it is already a magnet for people, uh, both visitors and people who move here. And I think that these kinds of arguably very inexpensive choices to take a chance on investing in public art are will be defining, are defining and will be defining further for this community. Uh, I, I just find it very exciting and I applaud John Holler, the City Council, Paul Gamble, and the whole team that has made uh, the NEA grant possible, uh, the city contribution possible. So that's exciting. Um, <clears throat> in terms of running a committee that is making a what seems like a pretty high stakes selection uh, happen, what we focused on, well, there was we there was a committee that, that helped draft the sort of charge or the call to artists. Um, there was a first stage where we qualified a group of artists as um, finalists, and then we uh, asked those finalists to prepare specific proposals. And at every step of the way, our focus was on a positive process where the members of the committee were voicing um, a 
affirmative and appreciative comments about what they what they found inspiring, what they found valuable, uh, what they found moving in the, in the artists themselves, or, or then later on in the art proposals. And uh, by that approach, we really attempt to keep attempted to keep the process positive and affirmative. And uh, I think the results, both in terms of the finalists, were quite inspiring, and then the recommendation we have from the city council. I'm tremendously excited about, and uh, and I think that um, for for the time being, we've sadly left some really great ideas, you know, on the table, and uh, I'm excited that uh, there's a chance that we may be able to engage with those artists and those projects in the future. So, thanks thanks for the support. I think it's I think you're doing the city proud. I suppose that just as a member of the committee, it was a real uh, it was an honor to be part of it. It was outside the scope of anything I've done before. Uh, it was a lot of fun, and I just want to thank Nathan for the work that he did in organizing it. It was a really uh, impressive uh, sort of structure in the way that we went through it that led to a really good outcome, I think. So thank you, Nathan, for your work, and, and obviously, Paul, just for your vision and energy and kind of moving this whole thing along. So it's been a lot of fun. It's also exciting to hear that you've got a couple other uh, runners-up, it sounds like. We've got plenty of sites, I think, in the city that would benefit from more public art, and so hopefully future councils will find a way to directly support that financially. Well, and, and to, as a quick reminder, this is one part of an ongoing process. Uh, we'll be bringing uh, suggested policies to the council for consideration. The community is involved in shaping those policies with the consultant that we've hired, uh, thanks to the NEA grant. And we've been having community charrettes and workshops all through the fall. And there's another one coming up uh, next week where we're uh, testing the policies now and seeing how they fit and what kind of structure the city can adopt to have a formalized plan for advancing public art. OK, so I think what we need now is a motion to go into executive session and also invite. And just to be the. Yep. The pain yes. in the butt here. What's the, uh, the, what's the will be the oh, uh, I, I that has not been part of my disclosure of contract. Uh, it, has the auditor well, been notified? Not sure. I Quite thought here. this had been August organized with you. No, you have been but, part of um, it. Okay. So, so the executive session discussion would be for the purpose of. Can I jump in? Yeah, so I'm the, asking. The uh, the artist selection committee is prepared to make a recommendation to the city council. Uh, We've been made to understand that because this is not a fait accompli, the city council may wish to have the opportunity to discuss the merits of our recommendation versus other proposals in private before making a determination. Is that an accurate? Well, it's the award of a contract, so I guess, I mean, oh, yeah. it does seem. Right. I, I'm, I'm, not really I'm not against it, contract. I just want to make sure we're complying with well, the no, law. That's, that's all in the memo, that's all detailed in the memo. Why don't we just, uh, why, don't we, why don't we pause for just a second? And then we're sure. I mean, uh, the contract is in detail in the memo, but the process that we're proposing is in detail in the memo. Yeah. Does it use the word contract in recommended action, but it comes down to a contract with the artist? It, it comes down to an award. Is there a literal contract? There will be a contract that. Yeah, $50,000 uh, worth. Would premature disclosure of your recommendation? in any way uh, compromise the city's ability to change who's selected in the future? Say that again. Um, would making your recommendation known publicly tonight uh, <coughs> in any way disadvantage the city of Montpelier in making the final award of that contract? I, I don't believe so, in my opinion. If it doesn't complicate the process, then yeah. really it's not subject. Well, um, I'd say more dead than make the recommendation. Well, excuse me, but we went into executive session to consider their finalists. What's the difference? They're once again giving us potential finalists that they want to have input on so that the. Just to be clear. To be, be clear before there's a, a I don't, I don't public have announcement. Have any personal okay. no, problem I'm just with asking. I just want to make sure we're hitting the, checking the right box. Of the I'm, so I'm asking what box did we check okay. last time and, when and we so talked just about to, it. Stephen is getting that. Just to be clear of, of what is, where we are right now in the process, 
there have been five finalists. The committee has selected a recommendation to make an award. The city will own the work. It is the city's, uh, the committee does not have the power to make that award. Uh, if the council would like to have any discussion before the award is made, I guess that's up to you whether you want to have that discussion in public or whether you want to hear our recommendation and, and anything that might be um, yeah. proprietary or, or I just otherwise. You're coming in to say, here's who we've selected, and the council was good. <laughs> I, I would recommend if you all do decide to go into closed session that you explicitly make the motion under which hook you want to hang your hat on. Uh, Either it's a personnel or it's a contract, because I don't see any difference between this and when the community fund comes in and makes so, recommendations. But we did it before. That's what I was asking. Before, when they gave us finalists, we went to executive session. I think before it was for committee no, it was an appointment. It was for these last these five that all brought their things. They passed. Not the yeah. These last finalists, the five finalists, we met with them in there. Well, I can give you my perspective on this: is that if questions come up around the assessment or review of the works and the level of those works and our our committee's assessment of those in the same way that you would assess uh, people who are applying to serve on uh, personnel personnel issues. We're, we're doing in some regard here about professional yeah. personnel issues. And I personally am uncomfortable having that discussion in public. So my recommendation to the, in the process was that this go into executive session so that we could be frank without unduly exposing which is what we did for these five finalists we talked <coughs> so I'd make a motion we go into executive session considering that the relationship to the artist with their works is like a personnel issue I might want a second but I have a qualifying question I don't I don't know if it's appropriate without a second to let that die okay. has I, the work already been I created no so then why did we do it before? I don't remember. I we don't did remember. it. It was appointment. I'm pretty sure. No, it was these five. It was these five. Like we 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 discussed who was going to be the last five finalists, and now we're trying to decide who's going to be the one. Yeah. I, 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 do you remember what agenda was that? March. I Sorry, we were conferring while you were conferring. Do okay. you want to bring me up to speed on what you were just asking? When we met to hear your input of the five finalists, the we met an executive session. Do you remember when that was? Here are, the, here are the categories for going into executive session. Negotiating or securing real estate purchase or lease options, no. The appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee, but they must make the final decision in an open meeting. A disciplinary or a dismissal action against a public officer or employee a clear and imminent peril to the public safety, discussion or consideration of records or documents that are exempt from public records, laws, et cetera. Those are the ones that, and um, municipal or school security emergency response measures. Those are all the ones that you can just go in. Then there are another group where you have to have a finding that premature disclosure puts the public body, public at a substantial disadvantage. Those are contracts. Labor, labor relations agreements with employees, arbitration or mediation, grievances, uh, binding and probable civil, uh, b pending or probable civil litigation or prosecution, confidential attorney-client communications made for. So my non-legal opinion would be contracts would be the only one that this would. Yeah, and I think the problem with that one is that if we don't meet the requirement that premature public knowledge would place the public body at a substantial disadvantage. I mean, I just don't, so I guess I, unless folks feel strongly, I, I think we two. should. It's a, well, it's a, I mean, it's a fixed contract. There's no it's not, negotiation. It's not like, right. they're not asking, there's right. no one asking for more commission right. and we're not offering less. Right. So there's not. And that's really not the purpose of the executive session. <laughs> right. We're not talking about negotiations. Uh, I would just said the reason I asked if the art had been created or not is because in essence, 
we're going to hire someone for fifty thousand dollars to create a piece of art and even though we haven't hired the other four people effectively we're dismissing them from this process we're also asking hopefully that they'll stay in the wings for the so next that, time right. all right so i think we had a motion um is there was there a second no, no. second okay I'm going to suggest that we not go into executive session, that we just hear from the from the board. I don't think that we need this. I would this think to assuage your board. concerns, I'll just offer a suggestion, would be that you offer your recommendation and the reasons why it is your recommendation. You don't need to comment on it unless other people who attended the sessions want to ask about others. But, I, you know, I think there must be a reason why the mm -hmm. top choice was made. That's then that way, you know, I think that involves, right? I mean, yes, you're right, the council and the city owns this, but we also appointed a committee to do this work on behalf of the council. And I can't speak for them all, but I'm assuming they're going to support the committee's decisions. I'll take that as a nod to the future uh, as we set up the Arts Commission and the empowerment of that commission. So thank you. We accept that. Uh, Okay, so but before we go forward, we do have a motion. And it's a I'm not I've sure what we do when. I just I, I want to also well, check in with you. I mean, uh, given that that was not sort of how you anticipated coming into this, I mean, I, I would like to err on the side of having more things in open session if we can. Um, would you want a couple minutes to? I mean, to reorganize no. or oh, okay. No. And I, would you be okay with doing that? I mean, would you? Oh, we're, oh, I think they're ready to go. Okay, yeah. I just wanted um, to check in. <laughs> and I uh, sure. want to apologize because I know you'd run this by, and I just didn't give this the That's attention okay. that it deserved today. So my apologies for not thinking about this, thinking this through. Um, all right. So did you want to go forward with the motion for executive they session? You can okay. Uh, I'm not sure what we do if it's I think that it's not. Well, we'll vote okay. and then we'll the go from there. Fail. But I don't. You need four to pass. Okay. So, so all in favor, please say aye. Aye. <laughs> How many is that? I'm sorry. Could you raise your hand if you vote aye? One. One. All right. All opposed? No. Nay. Okay. There you go. Okay. So the motion fails. Now let's go to the main event, main event here. So. All right. Uh, after careful consideration of five candidates or artist teams, the artist selection committee respectfully submits a recommendation of Rodrigo Nava and Greg Gomez, uh, an artist team based in Putney, uh, for their proposal, which is called Counter uh, Working Title Counter Rotation. Uh, the proposal with, with an amendment, or with a proposed modification. Counter to, to, what's that? Counter Rotation. Counter Rotation is the working title. Uh, the concept of the piece concept of the piece is based on a um, millstone. Uh, so it, there, are piece, there are parts of the piece that reference the history of the site and the history of the junction of the two rivers. Uh, the, they reference uh, the form of a uh, grist mill stone in a much larger disc uh, that is cast concrete and it, is, it can be rotated, uh, not quickly, like a uh, like a merry-go-round, but but slowly, um, and this piece is will serve both as a bench and as an interactive piece, and it has a counter on it, and that counter is attached to is uh, connected to a flip. What do, what do they call it? A um, split. A split. 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 Split flap counter or a Solari board. So if you've been to Penn Station in New York City or many transportation hubs, where the destination board and the timing of arrivals and departures will go and display a new, you got it. Uh, council person Justin Turcotte is displaying the, uh, the example there. Um, so the, uh, the, the Solari board or the, or the flip, uh, split flap board would be mounted indoors in the waiting area, uh, likely to be visible even from the outside. Uh, the initial proposal was to uh, install this piece indoors in the indoor area and it was the strong and unanimous recommendation of the committee that the uh, this offer or this uh, recommendation be made to the city council and communicated to the artists that provided they are willing to uh, install the grist stone the grinding stone uh, bench piece outdoors in a site that has been identified by the architect on the project 
then we wholeheartedly support their proposal. Uh, and the, the force behind that recommendation is that uh, there was shared belief on the part of the committee that uh, making this piece of art as accessible as possible at all hours of the day to the public was a major priority. And uh, uh, we believe from our understanding of the technical details that that's possible and would not affect the durability or the um, experience of the artwork. And so, uh, to be clear, the recommendation is that the City Council award this uh, Arts Commission to Rodrigo Nava and Greg Gomez from uh, Putney, Vermont, uh, on the condition that they install this interactive seating disc uh, in an outdoor space that has been identified by uh, Gosses Bachman, who's the architect of the project. Questions? Yeah. Justin. This is really exciting. What an interesting piece of art. And um, it, will it be a real, grist, like a original, or it's going to be created by the artist? Uh, uh, original, created by the art. Not, sorry, not an original <coughs> grist mill. It's going to be cast concrete, or that's what they're projecting. I'm sure that they'll consider other materials. Um, it's much bigger, I think, than any stone that I am aware of. Um, so it's, it's referential, but it is not. Um, it's not an actual artifact, nor is it. Understand. Person. Is the counter going to click off every time it gets pushed in a circle? Uh, yep. So the details are, are quite interesting. The the uh, split flap counter has 26 uh, character slots, and the split flap uh, drums, for lack of a better term, can be loaded with uh, Roman numeral, you know, numbers uh, in in sort of multiple languages, it can be loaded with letters, things like that, and so it provides an opportunity for ongoing community engagement uh, where that can be programmed differently, it could display haiku, it, but, it, but it will, part of the component is, as the artist intended, is that it will keep track of how many rotations that, that uh, rotating bench has made over the course of its lifetime. And uh, Counterclockwise. Uh, right, so they, they, uh, they stipulated in their proposal that the rotation would happen in a counterclockwise fashion because, as they as they stated, uh, sometimes it's important to go the other way. Will it count backwards then if you go clockwise? It will not, it won't it, go, it, clockwise. It will not go clockwise. Yeah. And will that counter be located at the same site as the seat? No, as I stated, the, Inside. Uh, the, uh, the split flap chart will be mounted likely indoors, uh, I think partly to protect it from weather, uh, but also that connects the indoor and the outdoor space because of the glass in the design of the uh, waiting room area, uh, our understanding is that it should be visible to people even outside, though it is inside. And there will be some sort of signage or the artist is going, would prefer to create some sort of a statement that explains what that counter is to said layperson? Correct. And a big part of the, the split flap is the sound it makes, <laughs> you know, as the message is being made. So if it is indoors, uh, there'll be a speaker outdoors, so that when it turns, uh, you'll hear the, you'll be able to watch and hear the sense of the interaction. And I assume this, uh, the answer to this quite last final question, but because it's not a real grist mill, people can't actually grind anything in it if they turn it. Correct. No, okay. no, no. Yeah, it's, it's safe. They can't get fingers or feet. How loud? Would, I just think we do. We are going to have residents on that site. I if somebody decides to spin this thing no, in the middle of the night, it won't be, won't be that loud. Okay. Yeah. So they're they are uh, they have referenced bearing systems that are used, I'm, I'm trying to remember the other context, the industry from which they're drawing those, but this is not a, and the object sorry. itself is not noisy. I didn't mean the, the thing, I was talking about the counter the thing. The split flap counter is going to have a speaker. And oh, uh, well, if it is electronically connected via, to a speaker, that is certainly something that could be modulated. And oh, yeah, probably shut off time or something. Yeah, right. And it's, uh, this is a case where the city is, the city is the owner of the piece of art, and so uh, should you wish to turn it down from 11 to, say, 6 on volume dial? 11 is one better. Any other questions? Done. done. Um, I'm sorry to disagree with the committee. This was my third choice, having seen all of them. Uh, I really love the stormwater garden and the whole sh reshaping out front and using colored tile to take people into the river. And I also love the first one that was not only interactive, but changes from every position, the sculpture, but he was offering an opportunity for incredible, and he was the first one to speak. 
and the only one I felt really prepared for community interaction of the creation of his sculpture. So that's my bias. I would have put either one of those first over this one. Uh, uh, I'm glad you moved it outside. Speak, speaking as a member of the committee, uh, we were really excited about most of these proposals or aspects of each of them. And uh, <clears throat> my understanding is that uh, council person body, you will remain on the city council. And I look forward to your support for public art commissions in the future. Oh, yeah. I want to go buy one of those. I just, oh, they're beautiful. Sounds like we've got a strong list of runners up that oh, yeah. can, we can support in the future. Any of these would have been exciting. Other questions? I would make a motion. Okay, great. Thank you. So I would move to accept the committee's recommendation and um, move forward with the process of commissioning this artwork. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? I would just also like to note, I would not be psyched to have a speaker outside with the flappy noise. Just making that, put, put that up there. <laughs> I'm sure that there will be plenty of discussion about the installation <laughs> and creation of this. In this uh, art, art work. Okay, any further discussion? You're not all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? I can't. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for all your work. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, she no. Horrible Donna, it's an opportunity okay. for us to fund more art in the future. <laughs> yes. Thank you for your work. Yeah. Quickly. Okay. Other, other business. Let's see. Council <laughs> report. Oh, yeah. We need to schedule me. Let's do that. So. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for attending. So the, for, I'm just going to throw this out, the only, really the only night next week I could meet is Monday. Uh, so I have time during the day on Monday. 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 Monday's the holiday. Ooh, that's a problem. Monday, Thursday. What is, what is that, President's Day? Is that what it is? I can't do anything until Thursday. I can do anything except Monday. Yeah, let's do that. That's, I think, a better way to do it. But it would be good to know because... We're not. We're about postponing it for attendance, and if we can't all be there, then we're passing up the opportunity tonight to speak, right? So I can do pretty much any day that week. I can make time as a priority for me. Yeah, I was just trying to get a sense if there was really going to be Justin? impossible I'm to gonna get clear my anyways. schedule to whatever works for the body. Mm -hmm. So I would simply, for me, tonight. Tuesday night we have the. Um, I was going to do it in the report, Commission. but we have the. DRB Parks Commission. I can't do it. Parks Commission do, but also the DRB is meeting about the Moat and One Taylor and the hotel and DRC. So I'm going to be here representing the city on that side. So oh. That's a conflict for me. But the other nights, I, mean, I could even do the holiday. I might even be able to do it. At five. Anyway, let's. So we'll, we'll pursue it. You can do a holiday. <coughs> Rosie, Rosie can't do the said she could. I I can't Monday or Tuesday. Yeah. Monday so or when Tuesday. When are you gone again? I can't do it. Till I'm gone Thursday. starting the following weekend. I could do it Thursday or Friday. Thursday's still for me. So Wednesday and Wednesday is out for people the twenty first? I'm out of well, town. I could do it before six thirty, so I could do it like five and I'm Wednesday. out of town on the twenty first. I'm not back in town until Thursday. Twenty second. Thursday. Can't do it Thursday. Can't do it Thursday at all. I think I I could do later on Thursday. Friday. So we'll try to Friday. Yeah. Friday I could do. We have something. I could do Friday. We have something. Two thirty to four thirty on Friday, but after that. Right. Yeah, I could do more towards the evening. Four thirty on Friday. So we're right. done by then. We should. Be yeah. Done. You can't do four thirty or after. Yeah, I can't do that. So, yeah, you can't do the three thirty. Right. Do daytimes work at all for folks? Well, I think Donna was out until I think it's Thursday or Friday daytime. Yeah. Do Thursday daytime. Okay, I guess we will have to do it all. Okay. Well, we will see what we can do. Well, we have to do. Some, the contract says that we have to do something by March 1st. So. Right. Can't do it. I'm not, I mean, I'm, I can't I do it tonight. I understand that, so. but we have, no. 
Well, I think what it might just mean is that maybe everybody can't be there. And, and that we have a hard deadline. The next week you're gone. The 27th, 28th, oh, you're gone. Not me, yeah, Bill's good. Okay. Okay, council reports. Rosie. Nothing to report. I'll yeah. pass. Done. Well, I just wanted to bring up, you all may have gotten this from the league, about a workshop on March 24th. And there is a deadline for early registration, but particularly for new council members, this is really. Which one is that? <coughs> uh, this is the one in Fairly, but it goes into. No, which the name of it is? Oh, the name of it. Hmm. Spring Select Board Institute. Okay. But it goes into the open meeting law, conflicts of interest, clean water, legislate. You know. Anyway, it's a, it's a good one to kick off. And I left, definitely want to thank the Valentine Bandit helpers. It's always wonderful. Uh, and as Paul brought up, it is our, our art. And I just really appreciate it. Pass. I just want to give gratitude for all the love this Valentine's Day. Uh, I'll pass. I'll also have Jeff. Uh, just a reminder that uh, property taxes are due tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That. Sweet thought. <laughs> Sweet thought. So I just had a couple of updates. As, as I said, just said Tuesday night, the uh, Moat site plan and one Taylor project is should be getting its final permits from DRB. This is for the demolition of the buildings and the adjusting the lot lines. So that's good for those that haven't noticed. The French block is under construction, actively under construction. You can see they're doing the mitigation and. Um, it's interesting we did the Black Lives Matter thing tonight. I just uh, wanted to note that in the last couple of weeks, um, Mayor and I attended an event on uh, for every Tuesday night there's a Spanish speakers that meet at, at um, Baguitos, and most of them are non-native English speakers, so they're native Spanish speakers from different countries, and they held their two-year anniversary. We were invited and got to go, and it was amazing how many different countries were represented there that are speaking in diversity. A couple days later, I went to the, you know, the Black Lives Matter flag thing, and then last Saturday night I went to the Ghana dinner, dinner at the great. high school, and it, it occurred to me that you know, 23 years ago when I moved here, none of these things would have been imaginable, and so it's really is cool the way our community is changing, and it's appropriate that we're taking the actions that we are, and I, and I, I want to end on a personal note about. Um, the Black Lives Matter and, and the uh, white privilege. I've told this story to several of you. I don't know how many, but I had an experience that happened to me a few years ago. I was in Charlottesville for a conference that you all sent me to. And we part of it was going to uh, Monticello. And while we were there, one of my classmates was this guy named Kurt Wilson, who's the city manager in um, Stockton, California. He's a brilliant man happens to be African-American, and great guy. He was there, and we were sitting there talking, and I was sitting next to another woman who was also African-American, and we were just kind of sitting there, and Kurt was going to go into the gift shop. And he turned, he pulled out a bag of Skittles from his pocket, handed to Lisa, said, can you hold them for me? I'm going into the shop. She's like, yeah, right, got it, no problem. She goes in, came back out, she gave me Skittles back. The next day, that bothered me all night. The next day, I went up to Kurt, I said, did I see what I think I just saw? I said, did you hand those Skittles to Lisa because you were afraid you were going to get accused of stealing them? So absolutely. He said, this is Virginia. It's the South. I'm black. And he said, yeah, and that's why I gave them to her because she knew. I didn't have to explain it. And I was like, you know, have any of us ever had to think about handing our Skittles to somebody to go into a gift shop? And here's a guy, extremely accomplished man, who thinks about this every day of his life. And I... Uh, I told that story to another African-American friend of mine, and he laughed when I told him. He said, of course. And he said, where do you keep your driver's license? He said, in, when you're driving. I said, in my wallet. He said, yeah, no black man does, because as soon as you reach like that, he says, we'll keep them in the, you know, up, you know, up above. And those are two examples of things that just, you know, when they talk about no white privilege or, you know, that stuff, it's, that's, those are things that we just don't know don't live with and so god bless the students for speaking out i'm done speech over